At we'll 6 o'clock, if uh, Councillor Eckford wants to follow that slice, we'll do the, uh, the pledge. We mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the flag of the United, United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with the liberty and justice for all. Uh, Carrie, will you please call the roll? Uh, Councillor Pietzel. Here. Councillor Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here. Sorry, I kind of skipped the order. Uh, Councillor okay. Smallwood. Yeah. Councillor Lee. Councillor Exner. Here. Councillor Schultz. Here. Mayor Pulliam. Here. Uh, Valerie Wicklin. She's absent, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, Fritz Van Gint. Here. Kathleen Walker. Here on the phone. Amber Richard. Here. Uh, Brian Singer. Absent. Uh, Jeff Carey. Present. All right, well, welcome everybody. Uh, I kicked this off because we don't right now have a chair, but uh, I, I'm not going to be, well, I could be, I guess, but I'm not planning to be the presiding officer of our meeting. Welcome to our first budget committee meeting. Uh, the first item on our agenda is actually to, uh, to come together as a uh, budget committee and and figure out who our presiding officer is going to be. So I'll go ahead and open up that discussion right now for uh, for nominations. I'll be out of town next week. You're out of town. Okay. So I'm, I'm feeling like I don't want Fritz to do it. Councillor <laughs> 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 Pete. Oh, I was just. Uh, you have something you want to? I was going to nominate Bethany. All right. I'll second that. What, does Bethany have a say in this? <laughs> no. <laughs> like she has the same amount that I have. It's called experience. You can send a long note on that book on the topic. But they're supposed to give you a script of all the things you have to say. Take it from me. If I can do it, you can do it. That sounds like a long speech. We don't have any peer pressure here. No. She's convening the meeting and facilitating the meeting. Yeah, we're going to and this is like a really nice move by Councillor X. I was going to say, Councillor Pizzo. Okay, okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> you, I think you do a great job. Thank you. <laughs> but um, I'll nominate John. <laughs> you guys speak? All right. Uh, when do we do a chair and vice chair? So I'm actually, we're just going to do a chair. I mean, unless somebody is just. Uh, to be a vice chair. Uh, I'll speak on behalf of that. I, I came into this meeting thinking that John would actually be a really good chair for this as well. That's who I was thinking. Um, do I have a, I have a motion? Do I have a second? I'll second. Or another nomination. Or an arm wrestling that. Or an arm wrestling yeah. There you go. Okay. I think she's going to lose the purpose. Uh, so I have a motion and a second to elect uh, Councillor John Hamlin as our presiding chair for this budget committee. Uh, discussion? Seeing none, I'll go to a vote. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? All abstain. All right. <laughs> Gavel's yours, sir. Thank you, Do I have my script? <laughs> <laughs> there wasn't a script. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> crap. Surprise. <laughs> Here's the agenda. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I will call for uh, the city manager. Are you delivering it? I am. Okay, city manager to deliver the budget message. All right, well, first of all, thank you uh, for being here tonight. To the budget committee members, um, congratulations, and thank you for being a part of this important process. Um, we appreciate uh, your participation um, in what is a, a pretty important role for your local government. Um, I wanted to cover just a couple things first, and, and this just because we have new counselors and a new budget committee, um, just really briefly touch on a couple of things that just to kind of set the, the foundation uh, for what the Budget Committee does over the next couple um, weeks here. Uh, so your role, your main role, is to receive uh, the budget as you have now, uh, the proposed budget, and then the budget uh, message at the first meeting, which we are here tonight. Um, the second important piece uh, that Oregon Budget Law sets out for the Budget Committee is to hear public comment and receive public testimony on the budget. Uh, and so we have that um, program for tonight as well. Um, and then, of course, you have the ability to uh, make changes to the proposed budget and make recommendations to the city council, which will then uh, adopt uh, the budget um, after their review. 
Uh, you also approve the property taxes, which um, you know is kind of an outdated model since uh, the property tax structure in Oregon has changed uh, pretty significantly throughout the years. But there is still that you know, formality of the budget committee approving uh, the tax rate uh, for the local government. Um, on a on a very general timeline sense, uh, I think of it as being a four phase project uh, process. And where we're at is in that second phase where the budget committee is approving the budget, you know, taking the public input, being that uh, public uh, involvement uh, piece for the city in our, our budget process. And then we go into budget adoption after this where the council has the adopted budget. Um, and then we go into the budget management phase where uh, the, the city and the council sometimes will make uh, adjustments throughout the biennium um, as needed. Uh, uh, and then we come back and do it again after a couple of years. Um, and then, you know, I, do, I did want to talk a little bit about what is a budget. Um, it's uh, basically, I see it as three different um, primary purposes uh, that are, are useful for me as I think about a budget. Uh, first, it's the city's financial plan. Um, it's how you're going to spend the, the taxpayer dollars, repairs dollars, um, and an estimate of our expenditures and, and of course, our revenues. It's also a policy do document because within those numbers are embedded what the priorities of the council, what the community are, and how we're going to carry that out and what they cost. Um, so, you know, council goals and uh, public input are reflected in the document. And then it's also, also a very important form of control for the governing body because it sets a limit on how much we're going to spend. Um, and anything above those limits need to go through a, a formal process like a supplemental budget where we have to receive public uh, testimony and uh, DOP resolutions and things like that. So it's also a, a useful form of control um, for uh, the city council. All right, so now I get to get into the meat of it. Um, hopefully everyone had a chance to review <laughs> the budget. Um, I love saying that because it's 100 pages of numbers and tables and documents and things like that. Um, I, you know, I attempted to try to keep the budget message um, as brief as possible and touch on the highlights and the, and the main points, um, knowing that we'll have a chance to discuss that tonight. Um, but this is my first, obviously, first uh, budget working for uh, the city of Sandy, um, and uh, in a lot of ways, a budget is anticlimactic. Um, you've had council goal setting, you've had uh, over a hundred years of this government operating, um, and so the budget is really sort of that formality of like, okay, here are the numbers updated on what we're doing, which you know what we do. We're, the budget's not a, a chance for me to say, surprise, we decided to add uh, <laughs> the fire department to our budget or, you know, um, you know add uh, increased taxes by a substantial amount. Um, if we're doing our jobs, uh, the budget should be no surprises. It's what the council expects to see um, uh, with of course, updated numbers um, to reflect your goals and, and the cost of uh, maintaining their current services. So my goals in doing this budget, uh, given that I'm four months into this job and I've had some chance to uh, review and, and work on this uh, with, you know, through some council study sessions and goal settings, um, is to, to really try to maintain our existing service levels unless they're otherwise directed. Um, and that goes back to getting direction from the council on things like the police department's budget and reserves. Uh, that was also one of my key goals, is recognizing that we need to rebuild our general funds uh, contingency um, back to a, to a level that I would be comfortable with. Uh, and then also implement, uh, to the greatest extent possible, uh, the City Council goals um, that were set back in um, January and identify where those goals are uh, won't be met, uh, such as the communications position uh, we'll get into later. So the big number, $71 million. You know, what does that mean? It's not really, it doesn't really tell us much. Um, so we break it down uh, in a lot of different ways to try to help explain um, a little bit more about the picture uh, of your, your city government, what it costs. Personnel, obviously, is, uh, besides capital A, is our biggest expense. Uh, we're a, an organization that provides services uh, with people, with uh, public servants like police officers and community services uh, uh, folks and people in planning. Um, so we're a service organization. Our biggest operating cost is going to be personnel. Uh, capital, of course, is infrastructure, um, sewer, water, uh, streets, <coughs> stormwater, um, <coughs> and, and sandy net and transit. Uh, so on the operating budget, uh, a little easier way to kind of explain what it costs on day to day to run the government uh, is about $45 million for the biennium. I remember we're, we're working on a two-year budget, so if you want to think annual, it's split in half. Um, 
number is also a little bit misleading because transfers are dollars accounted for um, between one department or one fund to another, so it really inflates the budget a little bit. Um, but you know, if you're looking multiple years and comparing years, we include transfers um, just because that it's kind of a transparent way to show what it costs to actually operate a service or a fund. Another way to look at it is our, our budget overall by fund. Um, general fund is our, uh, our bread and butter. It's our, our largest fund because it's our largest operating fund. Now this graph can change year to year depending on what we have going on in other funds, especially the enterprise fund. So if we take on a lot of debt to do, say, a sewer project, um, and we're expending a lot of capital, uh, the sewer fund would obviously be a larger fund. Uh, but generally from year to year, our, our general fund is going to be uh, the largest fund just because of the sheer magnitude of uh, that's where most of our operating departments are, are located um, and <clears throat> funded out of. Um, but again, uh, in that number for the general fund operations, you have uh, things like um, the transfers and inter service um, charges uh, between the two the, the departments. Um, so trend-wise, uh, we're, we're looking overall pretty flat. Um, and again, I'll get into this a little bit more right now. I'm just kind of, you know, I'm starting big, I'm gonna narrow it down. Um, uh, but it, like I said, it, it really becomes obvious in terms of the operating budget when you look at the general fund. Um, and, and again, that this graph is entirely, the, 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 all the funds, um, all uh, <coughs> categories, so includes capital and fund balances. But if you look at just operations, <clears throat> that's where the general fund really stands out as our largest operating fund. And usually, I'm sure it's the case here, we focus a lot on the general fund because that's your general government services, police, community services, planning, general you know, government like finance and administration, and HR. Um, so there's usually more focus um, you know, the public has. I should say too, when we're talking about funds. We have 13 funds uh, in the city. Um, we're not covering urban renewal tonight. Uh, but uh, funds are the, the kind of the individual self-balancing accounts uh, that we separate for uh, a magnitude of different reasons, and one of them being that a lot of the revenues are restricted. So if we're collecting things like water or sewer rates, those dollars need to be spent on water and sewer operations and capital, right? Well, the general fund, uh, again, why there's interest in the general fund is because that's where property taxes, franchise fees, state revenues come into. And those dollars don't have to be spent just on general government purposes. They could be sent to Sandy Net, or they can be spent on running a pool, or even cover costs in other utility funds. They're unrestricted, so there's a lot more ability for the council and the budget committee to use those funds for other purposes. Um, and again, like sewer, water, um, and, and stormwater, those are restricted for just those funds, and so that's why we account for them in different funds. So I was, if you do have questions throughout this, feel free yeah, to so ask. Back, I, so yeah. back up for me, there's <laughs> yeah, a question I, on like the aquatic, so to me, everything I've seen going into aquatic and recreation is out of the general fund, but it looks like it's its own designated fund, right? It is, yeah, that was set up as a separate but fund. But the 664,000 there, a lot of that came from general fund transfers, am right. I wrong there? Yeah, yeah, I'm right. Yeah. <coughs> so, so I mean, it, it, it's tech, it's actually part of the general fund, but you have it as a standalone fund there. But it's, it's money all comes out of the general fund. Well, there was some like uh, um, fees in the current current year that were pool fees. Fifteen thousand. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, got it. Yeah. Got it. Got it. <coughs> oh. Okay. But it could very well be yeah. a department within the general fund. Got it. So, yeah. a question to that point is. Are any of the dollars double counted because of the transfers? In in, in the aquatic, or, or, any, or any, any, of any of the funds? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then, you know that's sort of a casualty of having this budget system um, by law that we so. Um, so on the resource side, uh, we get to talk about uh, where the money is coming from. Um, again, one of the ways we double count is general revenue is double counted in our budget. Yeah. There's different ways we can do that actually moving forward, but um, for this year, time-wise and everything, we kept it the way it is. But um, our largest uh, source of revenue is actually fines, fees, and assessments, <coughs> and that's because within that is all our rates for utilities, including Sandy Net. Um, so if you add up all those different business units that we do, water, sewer, stormwater, Sandy Net, uh, adds up to a good chunk of change. 
Um, but the single largest source, if you separate them all out, is obviously property taxes going into the general fund, which we get a little over uh, three and a half million dollars um, a year. And we have other sources of um, revenue, obviously, um, you know, uh, fees for, for services and, you know, community services. Intergovernmental would be where we get the state gas tax and the county library district. Um, you know, we get a nice uh, amount of grants, uh, especially for our transit department. Um, and then there's like things like the loan proceeds and stuff, which could be uh, misleading again, because it's in our fund loans. And, uh, actually, this is for the wastewater project. So how much is coming from uh, property tax to the general fund? 7.1 million for the biennium. For the biennium, so yeah. for one year it's three and a half million? Three and a half. Um, About 200,000 more than last year. That's why you for Jordan? Mm -hmm. Oh, there you go. I want to make sure you finish. Oh, no, I just said next slide. Uh, I was, slide. I was going right into property taxes. Yeah, go next slide. But wait a minute. Uh, I understand that we have some troubles with our collections on our court fees and such to the turn of quite a bit of money. Mm -hmm. Is that included in this, or do we just say those are going to be collected, or are we assuming that they will not be collected? A certain amount of collect collections are, we, we just, but we don't account for all the, the back. And how it's due. Half, three quarters. I don't know. You, but you, you account for what you're estimating if everybody paid 100%, but you have uncollectibles that are separately calculated and potentially written off after a certain number of years. Yeah. This is why he's cheering. What did you say? That's why he's cheering. Not you. Figure about half of them or so. Uh, what's, what's this? Um, it's, it's been pretty low. It is low. Years because we have not had a good And we even changed collection companies. Is that right? Okay. And we've seen a steady increase since we've changed collection companies, and they're definitely working hard for us. And we're seeing those um, collection revenues come in. Uh, stronger than they were in the past, but you know we have I think 1.2 million in outstanding That's collections, similar. and there's probably only a hundred thousand that are actually on our books and oh, yeah. accounts receivable account. So that number could be increased by million bucks if we have the right kind of people. No, I mean some of those accounts we'll never collect on because yeah. the defendant could you know be deceased or sure. you know other uh, legal situations that doesn't allow us to collect, but um, some terms won't bleed. That's similar to property taxes, though, too, because this is the estimated projection of what we should receive, but not everybody will pay their property taxes. Yeah, well, there's a separate line, too, for delinquent that we receive in the next years or something, but it's definitely um, a higher collection. <coughs> yeah. yeah, we assume 95% collection um, for property taxes. And that's historically been right around anywhere between 94 and 96%. <coughs> okay. Do you often have to do foreclosures after? Five we haven't. I don't know what the county does as far as you know taking no, their sure share, it's but it's very rare. Okay. Usually the property taxes a lender will foreclose quicker than they can. Usually the taxes will eventually get paid because there's liens on properties that yeah. get sold and that has to be then paid up. So you may be five years out or something. But Whereas the other ones, you may mm -hmm. never get paid on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. I'm going to get this back on. Yeah. Back Property yeah. taxes. Are you ready? Yeah. 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 So three and a half million dollars. Uh, this is a chart that I, I like seeing um, as city manager and, and thinking of, uh, about our largest fund, general fund. Um, but this this reflects about four and a half percent growth um, of property taxes per year, which is great. I mean, this is a reflection of three percent increase uh, from assessed values being lower than market value, so we get that automatic three percent. And we're getting you know over a percent of growth just from new construction, remodels, but you know those subdivisions coming online, apartments, etc. Um, and so that does add you know to our revenue. Um, I, you know, it's just looking at like the back of the napkin calculation on what we what do we get from like a new subdivision. So for example, um, there's one that just broke ground with 37 homes, and how you know, many? 37. 37. And so the average um, assessed value in Sandy for uh, Residential single family is about one hundred ninety-eight thousand. Um, so we get about a thousand dollars of those of that um, property tax bill uh, in to the city. But of that, only about seven hundred twenty-five uh, goes to the city of Sandy uh, because we have urban renewal. Um, and so, for a subdivision of about um, thirty-seven homes, we're getting about twenty-seven thousand dollars. Urban renewal wouldn't be part of the homes because the homes are in the urban renewal district. 
there's the overlapping tax uh, districts. So, um, Pleasant Street has residential. They are. Is that what you're thinking? Pleasant Street has residential, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's what you're thinking? No, this is this is the this is the tax um, detail for uh, the majority of the city of Sandy. It's about 800 million assessed value. Your example is the 37 houses. Well, that's. I'm sorry. We could talk about this on uh, okay. next week, but the way. The way urban renewal works is a division of taxes from the overlapping tax rate. So it is a, the city of Sandy's urban renewal. Like, see how the urban renewal county is on here too. So we're, you know, city tax, city taxpayers are getting their taxes divided for things like government camp urban renewal and things like that because we're within the boundaries of that overlapping tax district. Um, yeah, I, I'm happy to talk a little bit more next week when we when I, I sure. can gather some more information about the tax rates for urban renewal and stuff. But basically what you're doing is dividing the taxes. So our tax rate for Sandy is 4.1152. The actual effective tax rate that we're collecting on is about 3.66. Um, and I think I mentioned this a couple weeks ago where we're forgoing about $600,000 of biennium in general fund revenue from uh, urban renewal. Yeah. I appreciate that. You know, this is, a, I think, maybe the second meeting in a row that you've, you've made this point and mentioned it. Mm -hmm. And I, for one, I, I appreciate you mentioning it because we tend to look at urban renewal money as something that we were able to snaggle back from the state and spend here. But it, it cost us our, in, our, in our budget towards police and, and different operational expenses and stuff that we spend here. So urban renewal money, uh, when we gather and talk about it here next week, it should be looked at as like this pot of gold play money. I mean, we are taking money out of our general fund budget and, and it's placed in urban renewal. So we need to be very careful with those dollars. Like, it's, it's just it's yeah. a point that's been brought up a couple times that I hadn't heard previously that I, that I for one, appreciate. So thank you. Yeah. The other point, too, is that uh, it's funded by a division of taxes, so it's not like you're paying additional money for an urban renewal right. district is just coming from the other di overlapping districts but you know there's a lot of great things about urban renewal as we'll touch on next week um, uh, but the other point to make here is if you're paying about a thousand dollars in property taxes that's about the cost of a latte for all the city services that you're getting from the city of sandy so you know that includes police planning uh, parks uh, recreation even the urban renewal stuff you know so not a bad deal in my mind uh, lattes are pretty good but uh, Knowing that you can call 911 and have cops show up, it's pretty good too. <laughs> um, the other thing about taxes, that <laughs> the other thing you need to be quoted on that. The chief's tweeting it right you now. You, yeah. see my, you, you can see my priorities. Um, I'm more of a latte. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, the, the other thing about property taxes is people. Um, often don't think about too is you, you're paying, you know, you can see the total tax bill, you know, $3,500. The city's only collecting $1,000 of that, about 32%. Um, and you spend a lot of taxes going to other um, things like education, all the different uh, school, you know, the school district, the bonds, things like that. So um, I always like to make that point that, hey, your whole, when you pay your taxes, they're not all coming to the city. In fact, they're going to the county and then given to us. Um, so that, that leads into general revenue, because we're talking about our biggest source of general revenue. Uh, property taxes, you know, um, seventy percent, uh, and and so the rest really are just the franchise fees we get from uh, utilities operating our right of way, uh, liquor and cigarette taxes come from the state and the intergovernmental line, um, and then just some uh, various uh, miscellaneous um, sources that come in. Um, this was a good point for me to kind of stress a little bit about um, our philosophy and how we budget. Um, if you had a chance to read. Uh, some of the, the stuff in the some of the uh, preamble stuff in the budget. Talk a little bit about expenditure control budgeting because it is unique uh, for local governments. Um, I think there's only three that I know of in Oregon, and uh, I've, I've now worked in two of them. So, <laughs> um, coming through. Yeah, uh, but it is an approach that I, I find um, actually pretty beneficial uh, for both the, the governing body, the council, the budget committee, and also staff. Um, the premise is that. You know, we're paying our general fund department heads uh, to manage their budgets, and we treat those departments just like we treat your our utility funds. Um, and you know, we trust our util our public works department to, to manage their budgets, their revenues and expenses, and and so we try to uh, replicate that in the general fund by um, allocating general revenue to each individual department, which I think is a way more transparent way to do budgeting as opposed to just collecting general fund money 
and then not showing any revenues except for department revenues and each of the different departments, and um, really not giving as much control, honestly, to the, uh, the governing body to, to change that allocation. Um, and I'll show a graphic that kind of gets down to that in a little um, uh, interesting way. But the other the premise for this is it allows departments to carry over any money that they haven't spent uh, in the existing biennium. And what that does is allows them to plan for uh, purchasing capital equipment and weathering you know, downturns in the economy. Um, and it actually helps me and perhaps the council as well in eliminating all those budget gains. Um, I've, I've been through budget processes where we spend a month in meetings debating over um, dollars, you know, because uh, the library is fighting with the police department who gets more resources and we have to analyze every single line. Um, the, the also budget game you get rid of is the spend it or lose it. Um, in, in some uh, governments you get this mad rush to spend all your money uh, in June because the fiscal year is ending and if you don't spend it, it's gone and it ha you have to restart the, the fiscal year. Um, so uh, uh, the contingency and the carryovers um, is, a, is, in my mind, a, a great way to, to eliminate that um, game uh, and give the, the flexibility to building capital for each of these uh, general fund departments. The internal fees for service is another way that inflates our budget, but it's also a way that we show more transparency in what departments are paying for administrative services. So if you treat these departments like you do utility funds, it's the same premise that they need to pay to for someone to do payroll, to do HR, to you know run the council meetings, all those overhead expenses are shown in those budgets, and then the those internal uh, departments like administration, like finance, receive that re as uh, receive that resource as revenue. So they don't get general fund revenue; they get indirect uh, charges for service. Um, so that is a, a primer on uh, our budget approach. And so what we what we do is uh, each year, each uh, biennium, uh, we allocate out the general revenue um, and. We start uh, with a basis of wh what are we collecting um, uh, in terms of our growth in revenue for property taxes and other <coughs> general uh, revenues. And then <coughs> for the most part, that's our basis for where we start on allocating that, that out to the departments. Um, this year, we had to make some adjustments. Uh, some of them were, were painful um, and uh, a little, some of them were tricky. Um, and yeah, we'll, as I move on through this presentation, you'll see what the consequences are uh, of some of that. But uh, the one that stands out, obviously, is, is police. Um, with the loss of a, a SCADA contract, and we've had a couple meetings about this, we really had to dial up the amount of general revenue uh, to allocate to the police department. So uh, going from 4.4 million to 5.6 um, uh, certainly was beyond that 8%. Uh, and that, in turn, uh, created a problem with having to ratchet down other departments um, in terms of their allocation. Uh, so our target was around 8%, and you can see, you know, there's rounding and stuff that happens too, so <laughs> it's not a perfect 8%. Um, and the other consequence too is um, uh, having to increase the amount of general revenue that uh, goes to the non-departmental um, to replenish the reserves, um, and we'll talk about that uh, some more too, but another ad for this year, uh, the, biennium, the existing biennium for um, 2017 and 19, you see the Aquatic Recreation Center. We also had to continue and roll forward an allocation uh, to keep the pool on an operating uh, level so that you know it's heated and um, you know the water is warm enough that uh, it's not going to damage any of the um, structure and things like that. So, can I ask a question about that? Yeah, in particular. So, knowing that there are staffing. Uh, costs associated with the current budget level for 1719 with aquatics. Mm -hmm. So we've got a percentage of somebody's time or multiple people's time. Mm -hmm. Do we reallocate that as well to back to the other departments? Yeah, the there's, department? there's, uh, I, and Tony can probably can address this when we get into the department <coughs> presentations, but um, we did change that. Uh, there is still a little bit of allocation in there to, for just general maintenance, you know, making some make, making sure someone's in there, make sure the pumps are running and all that, but uh, we did have to um, put, reallocate um, like Tanya's time into the other departments. So I guess this is a good time as any. As I was looking through the budget, one of the things I, I kept noticing is that the econo economic development's getting less out of mm -hmm. the general fund. Is that because you're uh, making up for a lot of that in our, out of the urban renewal fund? That's correct. Yep. Okay. And then there was a statement, um, that we have, I think it was four more full-time 
uh, employees overall. Mm -hmm. That's even after the closing of the aquatic center. I mean, how does that work out? Is that because a lot of those employees were not full time? Yeah, well, because it, we never, um, we didn't update the, we don't typically update FDE numbers in the middle of the biennium, but that was basically a spike and then all the spikes going back down, so. Uh, okay, yeah. yeah. That was just too far. When you um, allocate money to the different departments from the main costs, do you do it by number of employees or dollars or different formulas for different sections? So this was, so the allocation, so one of the things that we'll be working on in the next couple of years is allocations on indirect service costs uh, and then allocations on general revenue too. And this is something that we need to work all work together on is um, making sure we're in a good position moving forward. Um, but I believe it was based on operating budget set at some magic time. <laughs> uh, and person, or yeah. the number of FTE and operating budgets. Yeah, operating budget and FTE. And then basically that formula existed and we just added over the years the whatever the revenue collection is, that's what the departments would get. So if general revenue was going to eight by eight per, eight eight percent, generally eight to nine percent, that's what we allocated out to departments unless we needed to make some changes as we see on this. A couple big ones. Mm -hmm. uh, in the numbers and such, so we were talking about one of our goals is to look at employee compensation to see if that is suggested for the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Is that or not? It's a, it's a great question. So um, it's it's not displayed here because it, where I would propose, depending on the, the outcome of the study, would be to move it out of contingency, which goes against really my. Um, yeah. uh, because you you only can I I, I yeah. read that in your in your notes is because we're only setting it at five percent. Right, and it's at five percent right now. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> and we had more than that. Uh, and then the, the changes we need to make to the police department after the meeting um, this month is basically we're still at eight percent. We're still at five percent in, in reserves, but I also had to set aside in that fund um, for the compensation study results. Yeah. So that would still be my recommendation when we get to that point. It, you know, something I'm committed to. So, and I think it's it's worth it. Uh, but it would be a use of contingency. Uh, so I saw this graphic kind of this from Scott Lazenby because he showed it. Um, <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, we had a question. <laughs> oh, I was just going to say on the equalization study for equal pay, don't you have three years to implement it? Um, I, that's separate from the compensation study. And then we'll still be doing the other. Uh, are we? So you're legally bound to the equ pay equity. Yeah. Act, but the. Uh, compensation study would be a separate mm -hmm. thing taken on by the city. Sometimes pairing the two somewhat close together can be a good or bad idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm. So here's a very <laughs> uh, basic graphic. Um, <laughs> excuse my drawing skills, but uh, the purpose of this is show like. <laughs> How general revenue is received is, is similar to like a pipe system, right? So it, it comes in um, and it goes out. And <laughs> very basic, right? So general revenue comes in and on the side are supposed to be valves, right? The council has the ability to change those valves and that basically changes the flow of water or revenue into the different departments. And so this is kind of uh, supposed to be like, you know, it, it has valves up to code. Mike yeah, I know, you know. It's a sewer too much. But it, but it does give you a, like a visual of how this works, right? So we get general revenue, a lot of it is going to police, right? Like 60% right off the top is going to police. Um, and they get a little bit of, on the, on the right hand side is, um, is department revenue. So they get a little bit of department revenue, a little compared to uh, the general revenue they're getting. Um, and then, you know, a lot goes out in terms of the size of their budget, right? Um, the library, they get more department revenue because of their intergovernmental um, revenue from the county district. Then they get general fund support. The general fund support's only, uh, you know, less than 400,000. Planning is the same case where they get, you know, planning fees and, and permits um, and, and just a little bit of general revenue. Um, but the you know the rest uh, parks and seniors and recreation um, are uh, you know funded by uh, you know general revenue and again all, they all have valves where you can you know tighten up uh, the allocation for one department loosen up the other and that's kind of what we do in the process but the council has that ability too and 
um, kind of just making that point that that's, that's sort of the, the way to set these high-level priorities, right, is giving us direction that, you know, police is, you know, a priority. We want to make sure they're fully funded. Open that thing up. Or, you know, we really want to focus on, you know, senior programming this year. Open that thing up a little bit and tighten down, you know, maybe planning or, or the library or whatever. Um, and, and so I don't know if that's helpful. Sorry for the, the poor graphic. That's what I can do. <laughs> we'll <blame> Scott. <laughs> yeah. Scott's is actually better. I should have just taken his. Um, <laughs> so the, this is where I want to kind of get into, um, you know, the, the message itself is that, you know, this was, um, for me, a challenge in the sense of the pressures on the operating budget. Um, and uh, a lot of those have to do with sort of the challenges that we faced um, or facing in the current biennium, uh, having to fund the pool, uh, coming out of general fund reserves, um, you know, having some staffing needs that we needed to fund, um, and, uh, you know, obviously the police department vacancy and the police department balancing issue with SDK to contract was a major theme that, you know, the council's been wrestling with for the last couple months. But the operating budget, um, you know, to put some of these numbers, uh, some of these terms into more um, numbers, you know, PERS alone is over half a million dollars to the city. You know, so if that was number was flat, that's a half a million dollars. I, I love that. You know, um, so the the specter that PERS increases are causing you know pressure on the budget is true. You know, um, and I know the state has some uh, proposals uh, they're working on, possibly you know initiatives and um, you know coming onto the ballot or so. But these are things that are kind of out of out of our control, right? Um, that we're just kind of left having to deal with the consequences, um, and. Uh, the other is health insurance premiums. Again, we don't have a whole lot of control on that. We have some, but, but not a lot. Um, uh, and then uh, other pressures that, uh, that we're facing, uh, the underfunded loans. Um, so, you know, the police has, to, has debt service to the transit department for one. So that takes, um, you know, eats into their budget. And then, you know, spending reserves in one biennium, while well, it's there for a reason, you know, contingency's there to be a contingency for things that come up, unexpected uh, needs and, uh, priorities that shift, um, but when we spend that, we have to put money back into it. Um, and th where that money comes from is, uh, in this biennium, it's coming from general revenue. Um, so that general revenue then is not getting allocated out, out to the departments. Jordan, real quick for the committee, mm -hmm. uh, the PERS increase and the health, health insurance premium increases, City. what percentages of increase do those represent over the biennium? What's the percentage on that? <coughs> is that for you or by you know, open. Hold on. <laughs> Those are by That's by them. Them. Yeah. Is that a PERS increase or is that the PERS what we pay currently? That's the increase. That's the increase. So the police department alone is over $100,000 for the biennium. <coughs> so for the upcoming biennium, <coughs> um, you have the rates, you don't have the rates up there. Um, our PERS rates are increasing anywhere from 20 to 34 percent. So, for example, a general service employee um, currently 13.28 percent is going up to 17.87 percent. Um, for a tier one police officer, currently 21.86 percent going up to 26.4 percent. So, um, you know, it's it's a substantial cost, and on top of that is the other six percent that is the employee portion that the city picks up. So fairly historical high increases mm -hmm. for this yeah. biennium, mm -hmm. the previous one before that, there's more anticipated there's more coming. to come along the way. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for about the next 12 years or so. Yeah. Oh, that was going to be my question is, I've been hearing that we have mm -hmm. two to four years and then it plateaus off for the PERS increases. Is that what we're still hearing? Or? Be a little bit longer when the that. government solves it. <laughs> That that well, and, yeah, okay. this is going to be another decade, and that's that has to do with the payments to current retirees too, and all the other math. Um, so this is a scary graph. I don't want to, you know, my my point is not to scare and and cause alarm. It's uh, this is more about showing um, sort of you know the situation that we're going to be operating in um, as I kind of set the theme for what this biennium is going to mean for at least budget management uh, for department heads and for myself. Um, the budget's still balanced, right? So the red line is crossing the blue line. Uh, the budget's still balanced because this doesn't account for 
uh, fund balances, transfers, uh, carryovers, contingencies, and things like that. This is purely just um, ongoing revenue and ongoing expenditures in the general fund. Um, and so uh, what this means is that things like those, that operating pressure I was talking about, having to rebuild reserves um, and you know, purse increases and the like and, um, are causing us to cross that line. Uh, and that tells me that uh, we need to do some belt tightening, we need to hold the line, and we need to be uh, uh, fiscally prudent over the next couple of years in, in making sure that we're living within our means. Um, so we need to think twice when we're adding services, when we're talking about uh, adding you know, staff or, or new programs um, to, to make sure if we do, we, we find a revenue source for that. Um, so I, you know, again, I'm not, I don't want to scare folks because it is a balanced budget, um, but you know, we're in the situation where the lines are, are crossing um, and how we're you know, closing that gap is the uh, is um, is doing carryover. Um, is, you know, spending our, our savings and, and our build up to you know, kind of weather this as we um, you know get more on a straightened path and, and correct some of the um, you know sp spending of the reserves and things like that. But I also want to say we budget very conservatively, right? So this this looks um, each year kind of looks this way, and then you will get an update from us in a year saying, hey, we got three hundred thousand more dollars, and you know, general fund, you know, property taxes, or things like that. So we do our best to estimate revenues, but we always want to be conservative in both revenue and expenditures. So, you know, the departments do estimates to come up with their their carryover and their contingencies, but they're again based on um, pretty uh, conservative estimates because you always want to come under budget, right? Legally, we have to. Right. So we're going to estimate low revenue and low expense, you know, and higher expenditures, and then at the end of the year, we're like, oh, hey, more money, um, and that's completely fine. But this at least is a is kind of a leading indicator for me that um, you know, going back to some of those things that I that I just kind of talked about. So, Jan, I was going to say I'm on the county's budget committee, and their line looks the same. Yeah. And it goes out ten years and looks even worse. So we're not alone. They just have more Certainly. zeros. <laughs> Jordan, there is a way to increase revenues. I immediately have to want to go down to, to Reno or anything like that. It's probably not the best bet. Is that right? Best bet? No, no, wait, do it, talk to if, we, um, if we were, for example, to get uh, an in injection in commercial growth, that's really where a lot of the price tag comes for us getting an increase in property taxes, right? If we were to build out on some of these commercial lands that are just sitting there for Yeah, except that they are in the urban real district. Right? Yeah. But they, yeah. There are probably not too many other places, or is there? Um, you know, there is a lag, too, on a lot of the developments that are being under construction or coming online, too. You know, the apartments, uh, some condos, uh, you know, the, the um, subdivisions that I mentioned earlier, you know, it's $30,000 a year. Um, so that adds up. Um, plus, we're getting 4.5% um, of revenue. So, you know, and also, you know, think some of these other things I was talking about with the, sp the spending of the reserves and the aquatic <laughs> center. So we, you know, we spend a lot of resources in the current biennium. And if, you know, going forward, if we're able to not have to, you know, drain reserves for, you know, running the pool and things like that, which the council made that decision, then that helps, you know, for the next biennium, we're not having to then rebuild those reserves. That's half a million dollars that right off the top doesn't have to go back into our reserve account. Um, questions. Um, I want to touch a little bit on, on staff and pot, um, you know our, our FTEs overall. A lot of times people like to see them in terms of um, FTEs per uh, thousand population. Um, you know what, what kind of indicator is that? I don't know. It's just one of those things we, we do because it puts things into more um, digestible terms. But you know we're about at seven. Um, which, you know, in my experience, is, is pretty pretty in line with other cities that have the services that we do. And a lot of cities don't have services like SandyNet. Um, uh, but uh, I also wanted to, we added this graph into the, the budget because it helped me kind of explain, you know, the changes that were happening between the adopted budget and then this proposed budget because there were, there were a lot of changes that, and, and rightfully so, it's a two-year budget, right? You know, things happen in the middle of the year and priorities shift. But... Um, you know, I did kind of want to walk through uh, in this graph and adding this graph to the budget um, what those changes were. And so, um, and, and also show that while FDEs are up um, since, you know, the budget was adopted in 2017, um, what we're proposing is actually a decrease because of 
uh, the, the vacancies not being filled in the police department per uh, the council direction uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, so that's the, the primary message here. The other one is we are adding just a one, I think, uh, FTE. All these little numbers is because of you know part-time shifts and hours and things like that. But um, the big moves are uh, adding a utility worker for the phase one work for our uh, sewer system, um, and getting out there and doing the I and I work and um, you know helping run that. Um, so real quick on yeah. that first, can you go back one? So that FTE per thousand population. Mm -hmm. So putting that in perspective of an eleven thousand population person population, how many FTE per thousand. We're looking at about five and a half FTE total for the city to be in on target with the growth of, of where other cities are. So th are the bar are the is the bar graph that's reading at seven and a half on the far right side of the, of that, the graph. No, that corresponds to eleven thousand on the left hand side. Okay. Whereas the yeah. Move on. Brownish, whatever. Move on. Yeah. 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 Y
Um, <laughs> <laughs> she's there. Any other questions for Jordan on the budget message? Is it legally possible to allocate funds for only one year of biennium? Um, well, sure. Uh, we would just uh, budget half. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Some c cities actually show both years. You know, they have they d you adopt the the full biennium, but you show what you know fiscal year nineteen twenty and then twenty twenty one. Maybe something to think about. All between mm -hmm. one and zero, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yes. yeah, you, yeah, yeah. Uh, just in general, though, <laughs> easier that way. <laughs> Great. Um, we got uh, ten minutes until the game. No, it's yeah. seven thirty. I was. Oh, good. Off. Great. Yeah, a little bit more time. <laughs> we don't want to rush the departments. Uh, or, or <laughs> more, you can put it, the game on one of the TV. This one right here. Yes. Well, you can get that. So, um, for how much time are we allocating per department head? Are we at that point? We we are on that that point. Um, you know, they, it depends on uh, the department uh, and how fast they talk. No, um, about five minutes or so, with, and then um, open for Q and A. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Cool. We should launch ourselves about Q and A too. You're up. How do you want? Um, Change the slides and things like that. We stand next to the TV. <laughs> 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 Okay. Thirty second recess. Oh, no, thirty seconds. Yeah. I don't know if it's. I think it's by something. One of these. <laughs> all right, we'll go back. <laughs> so, what Carl I want to ask. That's right. Oh, yes. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Mario. Oh, how was that? Okay. <clears throat> Hit it with a little fierceness. So, what I want to ask is for those presenting, if you want to let us know before you start pre presenting, if you want to make it through your entire presentation before questions, or if you want them to be asked in between, just make sure you're able to cover everything for a question we may ask, and then you go over it a few minutes later. So. Let us know in advance. It's your call if you want to have us ask questions at the end or not. You're welcome to ask questions as we go along. Perfect. Thank you. Are we ready? Yes. OK. Um, so Sandy and Hudlin Public Libraries. Um, these are the basic, basic statistics for 2017, 2018 for both libraries. Um, I don't want to go over the numbers. You can read them on the screen. But Hoodland accounts for about one-fifth of what Sandy does. So if you look at the numbers, Hoodland is about one-fifth of those numbers. 
Um, physical materials are basically books, DVDs, um, music CDs, books on CD. Uh, digital materials are books and audio books that you can check out and use on your device, um, like a Nook or an I iPad or something like that. Uh, the Friends of the Library uh, make it possible to double our library programs at the Sandy Library. So half of the programming money um, we expect comes from the Friends of the Library. Uh, and the Friends of Hudland Library support about 90% of the library programs at Hudland. Oh. Oh. I have a question on that. Is you said one fifth of the cardholders are from Hudland. <coughs> you were thinking about like, the district and the allocation of funds, about how much of the funds come from. Like about a fifth to kind of equal out their participation? Um, I have a slide that will show oh, you that. All right, all right. Well, <laughs> it's working already. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm, I apologize to people who have been on the budget committee before. You've already seen the, uh, a version of this slide. But what you might not know is in 2008, voters in Clackamas County approved a library district with a permanent tax rate of 39 cents per thousand of assessed value. Um, which in Clackamas County, the average um, home valuation is 214000 which equals $85 a year for each individual household. 100% um, of library funds collected um, are distributed for library operations. So that district collects the funds and then redistributes it to the different library service areas. Um, there is a Clackamas County task force task force that's going to look at library services and funding countywide. It's going to start this summer and last about a year and a half. Um, so elected officials, city managers, library directors, members of the public will be on this task force. Ultimately, when the library district was proposed at 39 cents per thousand, we knew that money would last for about 10 years, and it's now been 10 years. We're starting to see the crunch in between our, the amount we get in tax money and what we have to spend. Um, and Hoodland is definitely already starting to see that, and we'll talk about that later in the presentation. When you did the bond, did it follow the boundaries of the school district or any other existing? It, it's mostly the boundaries of the school district, but it takes into account census um, areas. Um, it takes into account rivers and highways and things like that as well throughout the county, so yeah. Who's putting together that task force? The Clackamas County, the Board of County Commissioners have approved it, and the network office will really be, um, will really be the liaison to they that. They put out for applications or anything for that yet? They're, we're, they're gonna go to the city manager's meeting, I think in the upcoming month, um, and then Jordan will bring it to the city council. Perfect. Yeah. So we hope to get full participation on that. There are gonna be three separate groups, one talking about library, services um, and what we feel like libraries should be um, providing to the communities. One talking about library governance and how the money can be spent and all of those things. And then one talking about funding ultimately and where we need to go. And last time we had a community member, George, from ours that really ran that sure. thing and made that successful. Yes. Oh, so hopefully he's up for it again. Yeah, well he's, <laughs> he's no longer on the LDAC and he's kind of stepped away from the Friends of the Library as well, so I'm afraid we can't rely on him this time around. But I'm sure he will still be advocating for the library, so he just won't be doing it in that role. Um, so the Sandy and Hoodland Library Service Area, as assigned by the Clackamas County, is much larger than the city limits of Sandy. Um, so you can see on this um, chart, if you can see it, um, the service area population for Sandy is 27,050, and our city population was 10,990, and that was as, as of December 2018. And then the Hoodland Library Service Area is all unincorporated population, and that's 5671. <coughs> so this is the Sandy Library Service Area. So you can see kind of the city of Sandy right in the middle of that. Um, so the service area covers almost the same area as the Oregon Trail School District um, for Sandy and Hoodland together. The Sandy service area starts in about Boring um, and goes until Alder Creek on Highway 26. And the Hoodland Library service area, there's a large portion that's kind of above the Sandy Library service area, but in general it goes to, from Alder Creek um, until the county line or um, <coughs> government camp is included in the Lipman Library Service Area. So we have about 375 square miles 
in the Sandy and Hubbard Library Service area. So it's a large area. So here's the assessed value. Um, so you can see that the city assessed value for Sandy is 331000 and this is for one year of the biennium. Um, the Hoodland um, Library Service area is about 252000 um, for the one year, and then the unincorporated part that we serve in the Sandy Service area is about 720000 for the one year. Um, so the city of Sandy gets an incredible benefit from the unincorporated population that our library serves, ultimately, and makes us have a beautiful library with lots of services. Um, where the revenues come from? So 83% of our revenues come from the Sandy and Hudlin Library Service Area revenues, that permanent, permanent tax rate. 10% comes from the city of Sandy, um, which is mainly for debt service on the building. When the building was remodeled in 2012, um, the city council agreed that they would continue to pay for, they would pay for the building ultimately. And so we have a loan and that's the debt service on that loan. 4% um, this year is a carryover balance. 3% are library revenues, so our fines and fees and things like that. And 0.3% is our, our known grants, although we get other grants, but we only are aware of 0.3%. Um, and that's a state library grant for uh, early literacy and summer reading. Uh, is that, oh. Go ahead. Go ahead. What, is that the grants? Um, I'm just wondering how much do you push the grants? I know some of our departments do really well and some others back off because there's a lot of strings attached to them. How, how much do you push for the you know, we, when we have a project that we want to get funded by a grant, we go for a grant. Um, we have tried to get grants to get hotspots to check out, because there are a lot of people living in the unincorporated areas that don't get good internet service, ultimately. They don't have Sandy net. Um, and so um, and we haven't been successful in getting that grant as of yet, but we will continue to push for that. If, you know, I've considered getting, trying to get a grant to get a bookmobile. Um, <coughs> Yeah, well, that book mobile, do you have uh, do you have that all laid out? Like, do you know what the cost and everything for that would be? I know what the vehicle costs would be. I haven't figured out the staffing costs because because I haven't gone for the grant, but I could. Um, let's talk this week. Okay. So, I have a question on the uh, the debt services for the building. Mm -hmm. Was I can't remember my age is getting to me. Is that was urban renewal money that we uh, put into the the library, I know some urban renewal was used for that. Is this, was that to pay the debt service on the urban renewal or was that the additional that the This is the additional out? debt service. Okay. Is that urban renewal uh -huh. eligible? Pardon? Is that urban renewal uh -huh. eligible? To be paid for the debt service? <coughs> I don't know. We'd have to ask the urban mm -hmm. renewal. We'll look and see what the criteria of that. Okay. I just, yeah. I'm sure yeah. Yeah. And I have a question too. Is that okay? Go ahead. Um, so you're, it shows where the funds come from, and it shows in another part that the general funds. I'm sorry, what? We didn't say anything. Um, Go ahead. Okay, it's showing like $3.249 in the general fund to the library. So when I'm looking at this where the funds come from, is that part of the 83% or the 10% or where does the general fund funds come in on this pie chart? So there's $331,000 coming from the general fund to the library. And that's the 10%. Okay. That's the 10%, I think. Because it's showing on the general fund for the proposed budget $3,249,693. That's the total resources. That. Yeah. You have an error. No, it's not an error. No, no. The, the, the county library money comes into the general fund and into the library department. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, thanks. Yep. Yeah. So, question? Mm -hmm. I have a tweet plan, uh, curiosity too, about the mobile books uh, bill. Uh, is that something that we should be putting on the table as a uh, priority? Because it's probably a pretty good thing for a lot of folks out there. 
although it is out of the city limits. Which is so that's why I wanted to talk. To, that's why I wanted to talk to her this way, because uh, for what Senator Thompson, because we have some of that money that we can go for. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to spend too much time if it's a project that's outside the city limits. I know. Well, let's talk about that this week. Okay. Sorry. And I, and I think we, it would be a new priority that we've given the city right. staff yeah. tonight. Right. So, yeah. and there's a lot of work that went into getting us here. The bookmobile could also be used within the city limits to go to schools and events and things like that. So it could, it could be used for both areas. Could the county pay for most of it? Yeah. Right now, I don't have anything to ask. <coughs> so the um, library expenditures break down. 71% of the library budget is personnel. 15% um, is debt service and overhead. Um, so our, our the debt service that we pay and the chargebacks that the city um, for the city services that we utilize. 8% is operations and 6% is library materials. Um, so a few budget highlights. Um, this year we shifted money from print to digital. Um, our downloadable ebook and e audiobook usage increased by 27%, which is significant. But just my family. Yeah. <laughs> Um, while, our, while our physical <laughs> materials, um, the circulation of our physical materials decreased by 4%. So um, we shifted a little bit of money there. We're also going to be investigating downloadable video. Um, so we'll see where that leads us. Um, we built in money to purchase scheduling software, which will hopefully increase our efficiencies on our staff side. Um, we built in money to partner with the community center for um, Sandy Summer Sounds and Solve and other events. Uh, we will be adding a library of things collection, which is super exciting. Um, it will include things like an instant pod, a metal detector, a VHS to DVD converter, a sewing machine. Um, the monies for this are coming from Clackamas County Solid Waste and Recycling, the <coughs> money. We get a, we're getting about $8,000 from them. Um, so that will be where that money is coming from. And it's based on our unincorporated population in Sandy and Hoodland. So again, this, the city of Sandy will benefit from our unincorporated population. Um, we also were able to increase a librarian from 0.6 to 0.75. I was hoping to get her whole, but I couldn't quite do it. Um, but she'll be working 30 hours a week, our team librarian. A few things to know about the 2019-2021 budget. Um, so when I looked at what the Hoodland Library revenues were going to be and what our expenditures were going to be, we needed to realign our hours. So in, on April 1st, we reduced the hours at Hoodland from, I think, 40, from 43 hours to 36 hours a week to make them come in close to their, their revenues. Um, so that's a reason why that task force really needs to, to figure out our funding situation. Hoodland is the smallest service area, so it was the first one to see the crunch, really. But that will be coming to every library soon. Hopefully not too soon, but we need to get the, the funding resolved. Um, our strategic plan, we've made significant progress on um, those four areas that are on the slide above us. There are two areas we're going to focus on in the coming year. Um, understand how to find, evaluate, and use information, and connect to the online world. Um, we just began holding um, computer classes in April of 2019. Um, so that's that connect to the online world piece um, that we were hoping to reach in our strategic plan. And that is my presentation. Yes? What's the total amount of the loan that's owed to the city? Um, it was originally $800,000. So it's somewhere, Tyler can bring that number up. It's not off the, it's not on the tip of no, my tongue. No, I have a number that I want to say, but I don't want to, I don't want to lie. Is so. that owed to the city or to the urban renewal fund? That's owed it's to, to the, the bank. bank. It's owed to a bank. It's owed to a bank. Is it there a loan bank. to the urban renewal fund for the, no. I thought we, okay. No, that's, it's owed to the, I think, Clackamas County Bank. Yeah, Clackamas County Bank. Yeah. 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 Six twenty six is what's left. Um, but talk amongst yourselves. Give me just a moment. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. 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 Don't don't make it silent for me. And the loan ends up costing us about a hundred thousand dollars in the biennium. Oh. So, so, oh. Yes. so I know that the city of Gladstone there was a big uh, thing with the county and the city of Gladstone about 
being used using the money that came out of that for the actual building itself and originally it wasn't supposed to be able to do that but cities had to come up with their own and then you know what I'm talking about yes. on that since that has been changed it hasn't quite been changed they're expecting the governance part of the task force to decide the rules on how the library funds can be spent currently they're supposed to be spent on operations right. and not on capital but didn't they just spend it on capital for them well they haven't they haven't, they haven't they haven't built a building yet oh i thought they were no, already they're in the, through they're the, in the planning process okay. currently well each city did get capital funds as part of it just the initial the million dollars yeah, the yeah, Gladstone million already spent their million they did. dollars okay. yeah. and then they're wanting to spend the other money on the capital yeah. if that were to come true we would have the ability to spend some of those resources that, which would just take away from other parts of the budget so but which would take well, if, if we could spend the library district funds on our Loan loans, debt that means we would have to reduce our services right. at yeah. the library. Other pieces of it. Yeah, if the, if the city decided to go that route. What direction is that going? What, what, what do you see the task force doing? I have no idea. I mean, hopefully they make wise decisions. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of lawyers And I involved. expect that a number of city council members will be on the task force. There will be two seats in each of the three um, subgroups and then two overall seats um, with one vote in each group so probably a lot of reading yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on audio books <laughs> <laughs> yeah. any other questions for Sarah uh, there's about 622,000 that's still outstanding I was close. I was right there <laughs> Sarah is that new scheduling software for the volunteer stuff that you call no, that's just for staff. We were using oh, okay. Google Sheets to do our scheduling, so now we will have a scheduling software that schedules way into the future for us and will be much easier to do. Yeah. We're, right. we're growing up. <laughs> well, thank you, Sarah. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you. Who's up next? Chief. Police Department. Did I go too far? That's pretty good. The smallest portion yeah. of the budget. <laughs> We are mostly going to the order that's in the budget. Okay. Yeah. Just numerical. Yep. Well, thanks everybody for being here, donating your time and service. Really appreciate it. Um, this is not going to be quite as elaborate as the library, although you'd think it would be with the budget so much bigger. But um, there's a lot, there's a few things that we, uh, uh, that all of you already know about is um, uh, what affects our budget the most. The um, few things here that personnel is our biggest expense, as you can see if you went through that, that's our, that's our major expenditure. And that's, that's pretty much normal for most departments is your personnel costs. And those, um, those increased PERS um, issues that we've had too, it has quite an impact. Overtime expenses and uh, special events that we do that affect overtime is, uh, if you see in there, the overtime has increased a little bit, but it is one of my goals to decrease that, and we've been working with our scheduling to, um, to decrease that overtime. Um, so hopefully, at the end of the biennium, we'll be able to decrease the overtime expense. Some of the special events that we do that really affect that are, say, uh, mountain festival and things of that nature whenever when we have a lot of people on, a lot of our guys are working during that time. Um, so during the summertime, it's really busy for us, and that's when we really generate quite a bit more time. And the training and equipment expenses, that just seems to uh, increase every year. Um, things are just more expensive. Uh, we have trimmed down that budget, though, just because we we're trying to, you know, trim all the fat, for lack of a better term, to make this work budget cycle so um, and then um, our fees support expenses <coughs> some of our goals I can see that. Um, and this is uh, through this this, this is this biennium things that we want to want to do we want to increase the business hours and um, to include opening back up on Fridays we used to be open to, I'm talking about the business office and obviously there's officers 24 7 but the business office is only open Monday through Thursday. <laughs> Friday. <laughs> it's a free for all. <laughs> Those cars from town. No one is open. 
<laughs> and we just pull everything until Monday morning. <laughs> Mondays are busy. Uh, so we, there was a point in time when we, we were open on Fridays, and, and we, uh, we cut that one day just to, because of budget concerns back then, we haven't been able to kind of overcome that. But um, we do have um, uh, record staff is now um, are, are fully staffed in records, so uh, that's one of the goals that our records manager is working on, along with myself, is to get the office back open, even if it's a partial day to start with. So. Um, but we get a lot of people coming in, and they they just they come to the police department. They don't realize that it's closed, even it's been that way for quite some time. Um, we get a lot of people that come there and just aren't able to get that business, uh, the the business office service, uh, for whatever they're looking for, with uh, copies of reports, fingerprints, things of that nature. So we really want to do that. It's a goal that we've had for quite some time. It looks like we might be able to make that happen at least partially in this budget cycle. Um, the fingerprinting uh, services. Um, Actually, we've already started to do a few already, so we're a little bit ahead of schedule. Um, I think by the middle of May, there will be a um, you know, we'll have to, we'll put that out to the public and let everybody know. But we've just just been taking walk-ins, so um, and we've already got quite a few. We had to train our people on that, so we have new uh, our record staff is fairly new, except for my manager, so they have to be trained on that. And we do get a uh, we do collect a fee for that, so. And that's reflected in the budget too. It's not a lot, but every little bit helps. So, and there's a lot of people that uh, in in uh, the sandy area of the mountain, and even people coming from Gresham will come out here to have their fingerprints done. So, um, it's a surprising number of people that come in and do that. Does the school district do the fingerprints themselves, or are they having them come to you to do them? They come to us. Okay, yeah, well, that's no, how they used uh, to do. They it. weren't. They weren't. For a while, they did their own. For a while, and and, and now they're. They'll be coming back to us now. So, okay. And we do some other, uh, and eventually we may, uh, we're doing ink, so there's other ways to do prints. Um, uh, there's a, a digital uh, fingerprint machine that's quite handy. It's kind of nice. They got one at the um, at Clackamas County, and it's a little quicker, but it doesn't have to be done that way. But there's, uh, there's a cost for that, of course. So that's another um, thing we might look into later is to be able to do more and then maybe use some of that revenue to buy that machine. Um, so we're kind of considering that as well. Cost out your <coughs> ink and wipes. Huh? Cost out your ink and wipes over the biennium and see if the machine would take it. <laughs> yeah, not quite. <laughs> it's pretty. Did you have a question? No, no. Okay. So that that's really uh, we're excited about that. The because um, uh, that was been a, a goal for some time and we weren't able to uh, to get it with the, with the staff that we had. So and being ahead of that is really exciting for us. So. And the gals are my Can I ask a question? Of course. Ernie, is, of course. Uh, so when we're offering these fingerprint services to people outside the, you know, non-residents outside Sandy, are we recouping the cost of get, providing that service to them in the fee that you charge them? Uh, we charge the same fee no matter where you're at. So uh, because we're really, we're really not providing an additional. So they're coming on their own to the police department. Uh, we're sending those cards and issuing those cards, the fingerprint cards. Um, it's the same, um, uh, there's no additional cost for us to do these um, services for people that don't live inside the city limits. It costs the same. Right, but the residents are, are, are the residents kind of, um, what's that word? Uh, uh, supplementing. You know, are we supplementing those, the expenses to provide that service? That's right, I just want so to make So I guess what's the cost of a fingerprint versus what are we charging? city limits that we're recouping the cost for providing those services rather than um, having residents help cover that cost. I, I, I think it, the, the question should maybe is, um, you know, what is the cost to provide fingerprinting services? And my understanding, we're using existing staff, and yeah, people come in and it takes a few minutes to, to yeah. ink up their fingers, and then we collect money for it. Yeah, we collect money for it. And the overall, what we're getting after after um, is probably about $20 a person, right around there, 20 to $25 each time we do this. <coughs> and it takes a couple minutes to do so. And also, yeah, it just takes a, it takes a few minutes. And also, uh, Kathleen, the the there's additional fees for extra fingerprint cards depending on what agencies they have to be sent to. to. So someone could uh, come in and have a, a, a fee. We have a flat fee for one card, and then for each additional card, it costs fifteen dollars more, um, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Okay. <laughs> You're welcome, yeah. Kathleen. Did that answer your question? I'm sorry. I should have asked you that. First. I think so. I okay. Think so. Um, All right. Yeah. 
So the, um, also, we want to continue to provide the service to our citizens, uh, the low response times that we enjoy here in Sandy. That's historically our citizens have enjoyed. They'll, they'll we'll continue to do so. That's something we always strive for. Uh, we don't want people uh, ever to wait for um, um, you know a long time for a police response. Uh, so our response times have always been low. They will, can, will continue to be low, and that's something that we always work towards. Um, uh, like I talked about before, decreasing the overall uh, uh, overtime expenses, and then. Uh, uh, continue to explore additional funding uh, mechanisms that allow the uh, police department to fill some of our vacant positions. <coughs> and you have all seen this. You've all looked at, got a chance to look at that. Um, our revenue highlight. The, the police department is kind of unique in this. So the the uh, our, our revenue obviously comes from general revenue, but. We do have a couple of other sources where we do uh, collect uh, some funds, and that's uh, Oregon Trail School District. They pay for a portion of their uh, school resource officers. Um, we have municipal court fines. And um, this is part of that uh, issue where the, um, some of these, some of what Carl touched on, is um, some of these municipal court fines are in collections that, uh, you know, Carl touched on that before. Mm -hmm. So we have outstanding fines too, but we do have, an, um, we do collect, uh, uh, you'll see the number in there for the, the biennium, um, and that's we we try to do that conservatively, obviously, because you don't know that is you know a certain amount of you know, how many citations your guys are going to write or your, your officers write, and how many you know, how many people pay and they don't pay. So we're conservative on that number. And then the the fingerprint program, and, and it's not a huge uh, revenue source, but it's something, and uh, it's a really good program for the uh, people who live here and around here. They don't have to go. Uh, long ways to get their fingerprints done. They just come right to our PD and get it done right here in town. Hold up, Bernie. Is 100%, and maybe this is a better question for Tyler or Jordan, is 100% of the fines that we've currently not collected money that we go to this corner? No. <clears throat> so for every citation that we write, depending on the date that citation was written, there's a fee that goes, two different fees that go to the county. Or one goes to the county, one goes to the state. Uh, and, and I'm not sure if that's what, I think what I'm you asking about the, is. the monies that we have not currently collected. Right. Their, their yeah. And so that's the, the total citation amount is what's in collections. Sure. So, you know, if it's a $165 ticket, 50 of it goes to the county and 16 goes to the state. Okay. So, you know, really we're only getting 109. Did I math right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, so call it two thirds maybe is okay. ours. So maybe 700,000. Yeah. Is what we're missing. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Doesn't some go to the collection agency? Um, they add fees on top of the face value of the citation. Mm -hmm. yep. So 750 is a number about? I, I'd have to run some more, you know, ballpark. analysis, but I'd say ballpark probably two thirds of that is what city uh, owed to the city, and the other third is passed through to other governmental agencies. Thanks, guys. And maybe it if we do like want to. The uh, fees were, um, you know, the fines at all were quite were higher in 1315. Yeah. Uh, and we, we have more traffic than we had before. Well, yeah, and that, uh, Kathleen, that's, there was, that, that was something that we discussed at one of the um, uh, council meetings for why that number was inflated at that point in time over our, during that budget oh. cycle. So, yeah, that was, um, that was something that was uh, for different reasons for that. So, I'm not, I'm not okay. From what I remember, I believe we had a traffic officer designated for traffic at that point. We no longer have that. And that was the difference because I believe I asked that question mm -hmm. that night as well. So. Okay. Good. What's water You have forty thousand in your capital outlay budget. What do you want to use? Radio system. Yeah, that's the annual. Um, yeah, radios. Uh, Radio system and some minor computer equipment. I'm sorry, what was the question? I catch it. What's account? the 40000 in capital for? Oh, okay. Jeremy, did you have a question? I, I did. Um, the budget for 1719 coming in and then 1921, page 32. You had uh, 31000 coming in for marijuana tax, but you don't. Marijuana yeah, we just did a, we got the one time, so when the oh, state okay. started this, we got, every city got uh, a portion of that the first year. Uh, oh, so okay. because. Until the moratorium expires. Yeah, uh, so okay, the, the, the um, since the city doesn't have 
dispensaries and things of that nature here in the city limits, then you don't get that. Okay, okay. right, yeah. And then um, on the fingerprinting, you're expecting to raise $20,000 with fingerprinting? Yeah, yeah, that's an estimate. Yeah. And a conservative one with what we've, what we've, what we had before and what we've had requests for, we based it on that. Okay. What we've had before, what are, what are the requests coming in, we got a number of how many we would do, estimated that went conservative. Okay, yeah, I just saw on the fifteen seventeen it was 2,000, so yeah, I didn't know if that was because the school district was, it. oh, that's when we stopped. Yeah, it didn't stop it, yeah. Okay. It stopped offering the service here. Okay, thank you. So can you a little, mention a little bit more details on the SROs, the two, the two that are, obviously one is in Sandy and the others are going out to outside the city limits? Do you have something in particular? No, they're, you're they're both in Sandy. Well, they're, yeah, they, they work at the school district. They work, they're based at the high school. But they do go to the, some of the other schools, but I think they Is there a, um, Kathleen, is there a, was there a, a budget, like a, the the amount they're paying, is that what you're getting at? Or? Well, yeah, I mean, it, it, it appears given what a uh, police officer costs and for a two-year period. And, you know, so, so one of the things is, I guess, I just wonder, since the school district has even more money than us, that, you know, having them pay, you know, close to a full price of the officer that we're, and obviously some of this is a joint benefit to have, have the police officer in our town, but when they're going up to Welsh's and Boring and things like that, um, then that's where it gets, again, supplementing, services for people outside the city limits is one of the kind of things I was concerned about that and if the school if the school district can pay more to cover that cost you know there's no problem yeah they're actually their their fee will increase there's we built in in the contract we're increasing the fee that we charge to them so that will go up all right expenditure okay. highlights um, so the uh, a lot of the major I just have some of the major ones on here as you'll see it's like uh, the, the police radio dispatch you see that's a large item there that's actually our um, for what uh, CECOM uh, Clackamas Communications charges us and uh, that those those are those numbers are fairly close I get the the numbers from the CECOM director before we go to budget and um, they give me a uh, you know cost per per year and of course doubled up for the biennium and that's how you get that um, that's always been one of the larger expenditures of course over time that we talked about um, the professional services um, you'll see a, I really I wanted to touch on this uh, quickly because I didn't know if, um, that's a fairly large line item as well and what, what's included in in, um, in that is a lot of our um, software updates for our scheduling software like they were talking about before we have we have that so. Um, there's yearly fees for all of those types of programs that we use, so that comes out of professional services. That's why that number is, you'll see that number, like, well, what the fuck's that for? It's, that's uh, what we pay all of our, um, of those types of things out of that line item. Um, and then, of course, our, our um, interact support, support costs. Another uh, um, big uh, expenditure for us is, of course, our fleet um, the, and the fuel that we use and repair and maintenance costs for those. I have a question on the overtime. If you were fully staffed, what would your overtime costs be? Um, they really wouldn't be that much lower, I don't anticipate. The, the reason I say that is because this is, I think this has been tried before in, in years past, and, and when I was here, actually, it was tried. Um, you have this uh, number for overtime cost, and it seems, that's a lot. Um, uh, that's a lot of money. But, um, you, if you add, if you take a, if you if you have enough of the overtime cost to pay for an officer, and you take that money and use that, you're still going to have overtime. I, it will be a little bit lower, I think, of course, because um, you have that extra staff. But still, everybody still um, takes vacations, um, and you know that somebody, God forbid, gets sick or is out for. Um, uh, and for us, it's it's a little tougher because um, we had one person that had an Achilles, uh, had an injury, and they were out for all the year. So for us, we have to fill that position. We have to. We can't just not say if somebody doesn't need to work that day. We have to fill that position. So, and that makes it a little, uh, a little tougher than some other types of maybe departments where if somebody doesn't come in, maybe they can, well, they can come in the next day and the state. Yeah. It, you were saying some of the overtime costs are also when they have to go to court when they're not normally working? Yeah, so anytime, and that's in their, their uh, collective bargaining agreement, those things are, are in there in, in, um, 
are worked into that. They so if, if an officer has to go to court on one of their days off, then that, that's overtime, of course. So, yeah. You know, and um, uh, even traffic court per se for all the guys that aren't here on Monday during the day. So if they have to go to the traffic court, then they get paid overtime for that. So um, it's a little different. Works a little different for us, and but of course the cost is higher. Any question, other questions? Yeah. All right. That's not mine. Oh, any, oh, so any overall questions? So any, anything else on my items or anything like that, whatever you want, before I step down here? I want to make sure that we don't forget the fact that we did tell the, uh, Ernie and the police that we didn't want them to come in with uh, some of the officers that were above and beyond because we want to look at our baseline budget. So there are some officers that you would probably want to have hired yeah. uh, above and beyond this budget, correct? Yeah. And it, that yeah. includes the lieutenant and the traffic cop and mm -hmm. a, I think another police officer. Well, no, right. just, just two. There's, the, there's a vacant patrol position right now and then the vacant lieutenant's position, so that's two, yeah. But we did, we did tell you to come mm -hmm. in a, a baseline budget. I don't want to forget the fact that we, sure. we know that you're needing those positions. Yeah, so what we did after that uh, meeting is um, we removed that the vacant patrol officer funding, uh, which was 215 16, something like that, um, allocated more general revenue, so took that out of non-departmental and uh, gave it to the police department, and then also trimmed up some other items in your, your budget, I think. Um, yeah, we made some more cuts. We basically just went through it, I went through the whole thing again and, and tried to trim is every dollar that we could and still make sure we have enough uh, money in that line item to cover that because you, you don't want to get into a position where you're carrying over on those line items. So, but we did go through it again and just cut. Yeah. Uh, so, so my, you know, my concern will be in, in our task for the next couple of years is um, making sure we don't get back into the same position. Knowing that we're going to have more PERS increases, um, this budget doesn't include any contingency or any plan for carryover for future, you know, they have they have expensive equipment that go into their vehicles. The vehicles themselves are expensive. Um, you know, the, the weaponry and all the other gadgets that um, police officers need. Um, that it's, I mean, it's a smaller budget than they had in the previous biennium. Um, obviously, there's two positions not filled there, but um, if you account for all the other increases, um, this is a certain. This is certainly a place that we did some belt tightening, um, and we'll have to. To work with them over the next couple of years with this. Well, so hold on. So, what is the process? Um, what, you know, when we we had that meeting, our council meeting, we went through that. It was like we want to see a base, the base budget, so that we can prioritize and then figure out what we want to do afterwards. If we want to look at, you know, a public safety fee, those kinds of things. So if we, and it's still, I mean, that is still a topic that's on the table for our council. So what is it, does this committee have to pass out a balanced budget mm -hmm. and then our council has to pass out a balanced budget? Mm -hmm. uh, so then what is the process if we were to say afterwards we, we, we don't like what that budget necessarily looks like, we want to have a more hefty police budget? Uh, is that just something that we then just go through and amend the budget afterwards as a council uh, with an additional like public safety fee or is, like how does that all come together? Pass the supplemental budget. Well, if you do it at the budget, if you do it say as part of this process, um, you know what, and, and I'm sure the city does this differently, but putting something on the table, someone can propose that I propose we add, you know, four hundred thousand dollars to the police department budget. Um, by either transferring money, you know, from another department or adding, you know, a resource like the fee or something like that, um, you know, get a second, you can run it like Robert's Rules, get a second, um, mm -hmm. and then that, that's, on the, that's on the list of changes to, to make to the budget, and then the full committee can vote on that as an action um, to change the proposed budget. Uh, and then ultimately when you approve the budget at the end of this process, that goes to council for, for the council's consideration. Oh, so that's something that this this body could even look at. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, well, I was thinking what you mean, Stan, if, correct me if I'm wrong, though, was thinking after that, a couple months from now. I, I'm, that thinking pro like I'm thinking probably. A yeah, right. Feed that type of thing yeah. going mm -hmm. into place, that would be on addition to what this was. So. 
Right. Uh, that's, that is what I was thinking, but it okay. was also, I think, giving us the additional option if we <coughs> decided to make that decision at this point as part of our budgetary process. Remember, it's, it's, it's always a recommendation from the Budget Committee, and the Council has the authority to pass, you know, fees and implement, implement yeah. fees, not the Budget Committee, but um, it would be a recommendation. There's probably three or four different ways you could do it. Yeah. Well, and just, just for clarification, my recollection of that meeting was that we specifically said that we wanted to take a look at the budget, see if there were some areas where we wanted to make some changes, Try and get the money out of the budget initially, and if not, then we will take a look at the potential of the fee. <laughs> so, in my mind, I'm, I'm just for information purposes, what's the lieutenant cost us? You said the patrolman's about 215. Mm -hmm. What are we looking at for a lieutenant if that's so, so, something down the road? If you can't do it now, can you tell me? I believe it was 265, but I can tell you in about 20 seconds. Just have to get over a couple uh, <laughs> columns. Any other questions for the chief while we're here? I have one. Go ahead, Kathleen. Go ahead, Kathleen. Um, is it uh, possible to expand the reserve program to help fill the gap? Uh, yeah, that's something that we can do by contract. So uh, we can't we, we can't use reserves to fill shifts. So we can only use them to supplement our patrol staff. That's a uh, that becomes a union issue. So we can't have them, they, I, yeah, I can't put reserve officers on a, a, and work a normal shift. You can supplement, you can't supplant. Yeah. Yes. But they do a wonderful job and help us. That's not it. <laughs> they do a wonderful job. I know all about that word. All right, you got our Some, number? Somebody else has it. Yeah, it'd be uh, close to 290 for, um, a lieutenant for the biennium. Okay. That took approximately 36 seconds. Probably. Sorry about that. <laughs> I'll tighten up my uh, my next <laughs> search <laughs> for you. If only your response time was as good as Ernie's. When is my answer? I don't I don't envy you at all because we just ask random questions. Yeah. Like, like I have the spreadsheet open. I just got to get to the right tab and call them. <laughs> Two yeah. Two years. Yes. Oh, We're around. <laughs> that's your number would yeah. benefit. Yeah, okay. correct. So and that's, a, oh, go ahead. As a new face here, how many people get utility bills? How many households are getting utility 300 bills? 300 and 35. 3,382 single family units currently, uh, which would just be your standard you know, single family dwelling. Um, there's 89 multifamily, which, you know, a duplex or a 100 unit apartment complex that is all considered a multifamily, and then 257 commercial industrial. Um, plus or minus anything that happened in the last 30 days since I've <laughs> put together those numbers for the April 9th meeting. <laughs> all right, any other questions for the chief? Going once, going twice. Thanks. Oh, thank you. All right. Community yeah. service. Yeah. You ready? Yeah. 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 Sorry. Well, can we skip over code enforcement? It had its own it's part of police. It's part of police. police. Oh, okay. <laughs> We're rolling that in. So you're looking at last year buying in, but nothing for this buying Gotcha. I see all the dashes now. <laughs> Sneaky, sneaky. Trying to do some cleanup, but all right. we got to leave it on the books for all a while. Right, for so. you. <laughs> okay. Thank you all for being here. Appreciate you volunteering to be part of this committee. I'm going to start with uh, so I have three budgets. Um, and so if we could do questions about that current budget and not flip flop, that would be great. So I'm going to start with recreation. I thought it was going to be seniors, but we're going to start. <laughs> so, um, first of all, I just want to talk a little bit about our department. So, this department has one full-time staff. So, even though the um, FTE says that it's uh, what 3.08, it is only one full-time staff member, our recreation manager, as well as part-time um, event coordinator. And then we have part-time staff that we have now become employees, so that has increased the FTE. So our referees and empires have now moved from contractual over to employees. 
So that shows a little bit more about um, the FTE. And some of the things that we do, uh, we are obviously the um, enhancement of the quality of life through any kind of personal growth, fun, health, wellness, relationship building. We're all about relationship building. Um, some of the major sports programs are Mountain Storm Basketball, as well as our adult softball program. But this could include our youth programs, such as kinder dance, theater camps, kids activities, uh, mountain festival that we do the pet show and um, bike rodeo kids parades those kinds of things uh, we partner with many uh, different um, agencies to include uh, specialty camps Camp Namanu uh, Maestro music is an example of some music classes that we do um, we've done stem engineering classes robotics um, yoga, those kinds of things. We've utilized uh, area businesses to enhance those programs. Um, an example of some of our participation would be that in Mountain Storm Basketball, we had 407 kids participate this last year um, in our kinder dance classes. Those are six week uh, sessions. We may have anywhere between 263 kids, which is about 1,400 visits uh, for an entire session. Um, and then going on, besides recreation, we do all of our special events. So a lot of people are familiar with our events. Our corn cross that we hold um, in collaboration with Leopold Farms. Uh, we do our Dogs Day Out event, which is also at the same time. Uh, that is a fundraising event where it helps uh, offset and provide some um, funding opportunities for upgrades to our dog park. Uh, Noah's Quest. Um, we do the summer sounds. Um, as we get into the budget a little bit, I'll talk about the summer sounds. Uh, movies in the park. Uh, yoga in the park was something we've done recently. Uh, besides that, we have community events that don't cost um, our citizens any money. Um, summer sounds was one example. Longest Day Parkway. The Solve at Sandy we just had this past Saturday. Uh, we do various egg hunts, team flashlight egg hunt. Um, senior egg hunt and a lot of these things as we're going into this next biennium we are working with the library on and doing some collaboration together um, an example of that would be the summer sounds we are working together on the summer sounds as well as um, we just did the solve it Saturday Sunday or solve it and the library had the repair fair there for instance this past Saturday we had shredding, we had a lot of different things, and it was a great event this past weekend. Including, we also do the operations of the community garden, as well as, like I said, the dog park. So, um, as everybody has seen, this is the major budget that we have, our summary. Um, general revenue has decreased this past biennium, and we have operated with less, but our carryover um, has a larger carryover through the years. We have um, tried to continue to manage our expenses and to build our cost recovery. Um, one of the things as we go into the highlights is that we have looked at trying to itemize our lines out a little bit more so that we can track our expenses and our revenue directly. One example is our adult softball and our youth basketball as well as our special events. We want to make sure that we are operating with a cost recovery, so this will help us to do that. Um, as I mentioned with the summer sounds, uh, we are now sharing the revenue with the library, so our revenue has gone down in that area, as well as our costs. And then our estimated carryover has continued to increase. Um, as uh, Jordan had brought up, uh, it looks like our allocation is less this year from the general fund, um, less than all the other departments, it looks like. It's at 2.9%. Um, so we'll continue to manage that and look at cost recovery as we go forward. Um, we have, as I mentioned, were our personnel services. We have looked at uh, converting a lot of our um, contractors that we've been using to uh, utilize employees. Um, there's also been insurance costs, um, the liability costs have increased, so it has at times made it difficult for us to find contractors. 
um, to create and to put on some programs for us in the recreation division. Um, but we continue to manage our materials and services as we go forward. Um, and I'm going to mention this in the seniors as well. Uh, we're looking at using their capital outlay to make some building improvements to our current building. It definitely needs it. Um, for a while we hadn't done anything because we weren't sure where we were going. Um, it looks like we're going to stay for a little while, so we do need to make some building improvements. We're um, also um, maximizing capacity as far as staffing goes. Uh, we're pretty tight in our quarters. So with the building improvements, what, what are we talking, wiring and that kind of stuff, like just real maintenance? No, I mean like some of the things would be um, uh, possibly paint in mm -hmm. the interior. Uh, looking at carpet, uh, looking at windows, maybe looking at efficiency of the windows. Um, the oven, that, and I'll talk about this with seniors, but we can mention as well. The oven that has been in the commercial oven is um, maintenance every year. I'm putting in a good amount of money because it's so old that I have to find a contractor who's, you know, an hour out, basically, and the parts are no longer around. Um, air conditioning units constantly having to um, upgrade and you know do some uh, repairs on the air conditioning units. So just some cosmetic things. I know that the overhang um, needs to be looked at, the um, foundation on that. Um, also, it would be nice to put in some furniture, some more up-to-date furniture, and some tables and chairs so we can um, work with the rentals that we do have. We have a lot of organizations that come in and use our facility and um, our wear and tear on our tables and chairs is happening. Yes. Did you say the dog park is part of the recreation park? Correct. Well, it's part of community services and it does come directly out of maintenance, comes out of parks maintenance, but we operate the, um, the dog park in the sense that we manage, you know, customers, we um, talk to customers, and we also do the fundraising for possible shade structures. We work with the parks for the support. And I forgot to mention that um, community services will be overtaking the parks board again, coming up on this um, biennium, or sooner. <laughs> All right, Kelly. So, um, <laughs> you can hear this a bunch for me. Has there been any impact from the community campus mm -hmm. on that take employees and spend their time on campus itself? I guess as you have some other people. Um, no, others, not really. Uh, the only impact has been uh, with the building monitors. So, and that is actually out of senior services. So, um, you know, in the very beginning when we first took over the campus, we operated Mountain Storm out of the gym there. And so, we did have some um, gym monitors, but they were definitely out of recreation. There was any other times, I don't think so. Certainly nothing in the future. Right? What's that? Nothing in the future. You're not, you're not planning to do any spending in any of the things, the general minimal maintenance that the campus is going to be doing. Well, that would not come out of this fund at okay. all. Initially, we had hoped to be able to use the gym, and so I think the last biennium, um, we had to put in, you know, for instance, um, basketball hoops and, and <coughs> balls and things like that. Um, you know, our expense on that end has gone up a little bit because now we're utilizing the school district. Um, you know, as we go forward, we'll be utilizing the school district more for their gymnasiums. We won't have our gym, but that should be pretty flat because we had used that most of the time. In so it won't be a big expense. I'm just now to bring up the gym. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we've got a nice gym out there, except for some of the VA things. Yeah. So you're not going to spend a lot of money in the school district? No. And use their facilities? No, I mean, we are going to use the facilities for sure. But, um, the gym. but with the recreation programs, and, and like I mentioned, that's why we're breaking out um, kind of the cost recovery on youth basketball and adult softball because we want to make sure that those programs are self sustaining. As well as the special events. Any questions about recreation? Okay, so I'll move on to senior services. So, with senior services, um, you know, there are various different departments or 
services we provide. For instance, nutritional services, that includes Meals on Wheels, congregate meals. Um, we do, for example, in March, we had 87 Meals on Wheels that we deliver daily, um, except for Thursdays. That's about 1,900 meals um, for a month. Um, we rely on the, um, volunteer drivers for the Meals on Wheels program. Uh, transportation services includes our daily pickups to bring um, seniors into the center. Um, that can include uh, also uh, participating in any kind of various activities, as well as getting congregate meals, which is through nutritional services as well. We provide medical trips to um, various medical appointments, personal um, errands, uh, shopping service that we provide on Thursdays as well. Um, and then we do client services, is which is where we work with, um, we provide Alzheimer's respite program, we have a support group, energy assistance program, um, we have tax assistance, law projects, Christmas boxes. Um, we had almost a 100 people last year in the winter time that we helped with energy assistance, to give you an example. Um, and then we obviously do a lot of fundraisers. Um, you probably know about our pies that we put on that help support our nutritional services as well as our breakfast with Santa. And that helps to offset some of the costs on that. Including um, with the services, we have trips that we provide, our recreational trips, um, anywhere from going to a museum, to a cultural center, to touring Willamette Pie uh, Factory, to going to the Salem Capitol to get a tour of the Capitol. Um, we're really trying to incorporate more educational opportunities as well. Uh, we have um, groups that come in and speak. Um, for instance, we're having, uh, we work with um, Ride Connection or Senior Health Insurance Benefits uh, Assistance comes in. We had a speaker on cannabis awareness. We had alcohol awareness, um, elder abuse, mental health. Um, and then with our exercise classes, we do functional fitness classes, Tai Chi, uh, moves and grooves, which Olga, our own Olga, teaches on Fridays. Those are free uh, classes that we teach. Um, and then obviously, there's also the socialization factor. So card games, pool table, um, any time that they can just um, bring um, to the center. Um, so here is some highlights of the budget. Um, we do get some support from Clackamas County. Uh, we see that the budget will slightly increase, I believe it's about $10,000 more this year. We're looking at opportunity to utilize all of those funds, some of the funds um, that they provide for us, for instance, transportation. Uh, we're looking at different opportunities to make sure that we're um, utilizing all of those possibilities. Um, there's, for instance, a CAB program that they're working with with Clackamas County that possibly we <coughs> can get some funding for that, and um, that's a pilot program that they're starting. Um, and initially, our estimated carryover um, did increase. I think uh, part of that was because of our delay in hires. We had a retirement and we held off on that delay, on that um, position hiring initially. Um, and then when we look at the FTE, uh, it, it really is two full-time staff. We have full-time senior services manager and a full-time client coordinator. Um, part-time food service manager, part-time respite care, part-time drivers, um, and then some of my salary allocation as well as our administrative secretary is allocated into this fund as well as in recreation. Um, let's see, did you get all those? Oh, and then I already mentioned about the capital LA for the building improvements. Question? Yeah, I have a few questions here. Um, sure. Looking at your the budget there, um, I noticed that the County Senior Center Grant and the County Senior Disability Grant yep. we've gotten every year, and then we don't have anything for this coming proposed budget in there, but I do see your beginning balance <coughs> as being higher. Is that 
It's just moved, right? It just. So this was kind of a just a finance department tracking thing. Um, every other department or fund just separates it out by federal or state grants. It makes it super easy when we go through our audit to sort out where the grant funding came from. Um, this department had it separated it out. With the county? County and, and um, ultimately they're federal or state that get passed down to the county and then passed through us. Sure. So we just did some cleanup to Okay, I guess it is nice to know how much the county, because right. going into my second question now, sure. is on the uh, Meals on Wheel, meal, Wheels? Meals on Wheels. Meals on Wheels. Great program, and it's an amazing program, and we do an amazing job of supporting our community members and outside our community members. Mm -hmm. But the questions come up every single time since I've been on council is that we support a lot of outside our county mm -hmm. with our general fund dollars, and it's a great program. And at one point, we were doing all of Damascus because we were doing it before they became a city. Right. <laughs> the area. Then they became a city, and we were trying to get money out of them to help for that. And I think they started to, and then they no longer became a, and we're no longer a city anymore. Mm -hmm. Are we getting any money from the county for that? Yeah, and what that percentages is, of those? Right. Yeah, that is recognized in that um, grant. Um, so the, it's the percentages. I did go to county and talk to them a little bit. I mean, it's probably only about 20% that we're getting recouped of our costs. Um, and there is no difference between um, in-city and out-of-city. So, but we are getting funds from out-of-city. Are we the only organization that can offer that service? Like, that can apply for that grant and get that? No, no, no. Um, so we're like a, a consortium of different um, centers. So Malala, for instance, um, Hoodview, and we're all part of the same, so they support service areas just like we do. Um, and then my last question was on the budgeting, the transfer from non-departmental, the $175,000 yeah. there. Yes. Just looking from what it was the year, or the biennium prior to that, it looks like it's been added in and then carried forward to this new proposed budget. That was a one-time fee from the general fund? So that was before. the hiring of our full-time senior services manager. So that was, um, so I think Jordan spoke to this. This is one of the things that we had funded for the full-time manager, but there wasn't any general fund money, so we had to use our carryover money to support that person going forward. Right, I guess it goes back to that base amount that we talked about with there and transferring it is mm -hmm. we take it out of our contingency right. and then it ends up being part of the budget for going forward forever and so it comes out of the contingencies for the next biennials. Well the, I think this the general revenue allocation is built off of the 683 doesn't include the 175. The 175 from non-departmental would be the transfer from non-departmental contingency and then the general revenue uh, increase came up the 683 so the, the the challenge here is that as Tony mentioned that that general revenue of 740 plus some other department revenues isn't enough to kick you know fund um, basically balance their operations so they're using the getting balance um, and they have capital and stuff too but if they're projecting at the end of the biennium they have 25,000 when they're starting with 200,000 Sorry, that confuses. <laughs> no, I understand. I guess I come back to the, the part of when we come and ask to take money out of the contingency fund during a biennium, mm -hmm. that's a kind of one-time thing um, not to be carried, you know. What happens in 21 to 23? That's right. Now all of a sudden the budget looks expanded. Because mm -hmm. it is. I mean, you look at the total resources and from 15 to 17, we added that there. It never goes away. It's now, so the decision made there to do that ends up affecting <clears throat> ongoing forever. Right. Which I don't think that is presented at the council meeting when asking for things out of the contingency fee fund to be able to do that forever, right? Like the money's coming from somewhere else after the contingency fund. Because basically it's robbing the contingency fund for the next biennium, the next biennium, the next biennium. That's just all I'm getting back to is the same thing we had with the police department. Yeah, no, it's, it's exactly in line with my theme for this biennium is we need to tighten our belts and live within our means and, and take no, that in consideration. That's what we're doing, though. We're taking from the contingency fund and then expanding the budget. No, um, we took from the contingency we, fund this by the current biennium. The current biennium. Okay. Yeah. 
So just ensuring that it doesn't turn into the new base of the future. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Why is the class and activity revenue going down? So um, part of that was the same thing I mentioned in recreation is that we did pull out a few things. So for instance, building rentals, I wanted to get a better idea of specifically how much revenue we're getting from just building rentals, as well as um, the trips. So we're really trying to become self-sustaining on the trips, for instance, as well as the building rentals. So those two have brought out um, revenue overall, so that would basically bring it to about 34000 It is down. Um, you know, I've tried to look at history. I have only been here this last biennium, so I tried to look back on some of historically how come the revenue has gone down as far as um, seniors, and I, I don't have a firm answer on that. I'm going to keep digging and try to figure that out. Um, you know, it, it also in that line, do we is that where donation money goes to? Uh, I can't remember which one, but it goes into one of those, yeah. yeah. I think it goes into the Maybe the reason is that the library has a community room that people use it. Um, that's a possibility. I mean, I think we're all full. <laughs> I mean, the community, the community center is busy all the time. Every evening, we have somebody in there, and most of the time, it is a nonprofit organization, and we do not get revenue from them mm -hmm. because we do not currently charge. So that wouldn't really explain that because that is the only time we really get revenue is when we're doing um, birthday parties or something like that. I'm wondering if that's something we should be looking at, trying to figure out a way. I hate to put it down the backs of nonprofits, but if I see your contingency fund going down, that's a you know, I, it's a concern for me too. I think that that's something that I think we should really look at closely. Yeah, I mean, we use uh, the housing development I used to be in had a HOA, and once a month we would get together and we didn't have any sort of shared space there, and so we would come to the community center and even pay in. 20 bucks right. to you know not have to have it in my living room right. well worth it sure. uh, even a nominal fee you know a couple a couple times a day or a couple times a week i two would be years. happy to bring it to council um yeah. we brought it to council a year ago i think you remember when i um, um instituted the building monitors because of safety and security we wanted to make sure that the building was staffed after hours and during mm -hmm. operations mm -hmm. and so that did increase our costs yeah um, but we were not the council at that time did not want to charge for nonprofits. Mm -hmm. you've certainly shown us a rational <laughs> that is important okay. Here we go. Right. any other questions okay um Next is the Aquatic Center. Um, this is the one that's a little out of order. Yeah, it's got a little out of order, sorry. Um, I think we, you know, we've gone over the Aquatic Center and some of the um, highlights of the Aquatic Center is that it's been open since July 7th. Um, you can see the before it's and after page 61 picture. in your hard copies. Thank you. Sorry. That's okay. You can see <laughs> I that. I saw them off the video. <laughs> That's okay. Right. That it. Just easier than me having to go. Um, you can see the before and after pictures of kind of the aquatic center and what it looks like. Um, there's some exam the, some of my the staff. Uh, over the past nine to ten months, we've employed um, 38 employees at various times throughout. Um, these employees are a lot of them were city our city of San <coughs> residents. A lot of them were their first time jobs, and so we were able to build some skills for them, job skills that they were not able to get um, prior to that. Um, and it, we also did about 819 swimming lesson registrations. Um, that's not unique users, but that's overall registrations. And uh, 585 private swimming lessons. Um, 203 birthday parties and about 16,000 total attendance. Yeah, 203 birthday parties. <laughs> um, How so many days were you open? We were open, I don't remember what it yeah, is, 180. like 180. Mm -hmm. And this was end of February, which you all have seen already. So March and April and, um, 
and they. You expect the team to run for their money. <laughs> yes, it's true. Um, that was actually um, one of the main um, revenue generators was the birthday parties for sure, and um, so forth. So just to give you some pictures, um, there is the budget, and you know the difference is obviously that we're not going to be open with full board operations. Um, so the revenue um, is, uh, what is the revenue from? Oh, just general yeah. revenue money. Yeah, okay. um, and so personal services, that is going to co cover a very per small percentage of me, I think 5%. Um, one thing I always want to remind everybody, it's not just the aquatic center, it is the community campus. Right. <laughs> so it's not just the aquatic center budget. So um, the other piece is the maintenance tech, which is the person, the C certified pool operator, um, and uh, he would be also utilized to do some of the um, grounds on San Diego campus as well. Mm -hmm. um, so that is what the personal finance, uh, personal services. And then obviously we're gonna have chemicals and um, heatings, minimal, we'll lower the heat, we'll lower the, um, the minimal amounts of uh, chlorine, but we will have to keep the pumps moving. Yeah, so, um, so that's. Quick question on yes. the previous slide. You had pictures of the yes. uh, obstacle course. Yes. So given we don't know our timeline yet, yeah. would it be ideal to find a purchaser? Um, like that? Yes. <laughs> I mean, what, 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 what is that? It's. <clears throat> I mean, cost-wise. Oh, uh, it's a fair amount of money, it's for sure. Part. Um, and then I have already been approached by the community <coughs> college um, in um, some respects on some of our equipment. So know. that is a okay. discussion yeah. Yeah. that we can, uh, I think Tyler and I, I mean Jordan and I have some meetings coming up to talk about the community campus. So I think it depends on council's timeline. Um, I just didn't know if we took four or five years to make a decision on what yeah. we're doing, if that would last that long, or if it needs to be disposed of. Oh and I would assume for two years down the road and not being used, it's probably negative stuff. I mean, there's a few years. things in there. There's for sure that, you know, we have an AED, I mean, we have a lift, we have an AED, we have a few things of some value. I don't know if the amount we get for it would outweigh, but no, it's an option. The cost down the year, down the road. What's that? If, yeah, it, if it would offset how much right, it costs to exactly. replace it. Right, you know. exactly. Your AED, your is that something that you could use at the... I have one over there. You already do? Uh, we didn't, and I... You put one in? Yeah. Okay. But we also put one in all the um, um, vehicles, too. Okay. But it is one that we probably could source. Awesome. There's a few here? things. So, so we have I mean, one in every building. Do we have yeah. 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 Sandy, didn't have one? <laughs> no, that I do not know. <laughs> Probably not. I don't know if you want to get those guys <laughs> ADs. <laughs> I mean, there. I mean, also there's computers. I mean, there's some things we yeah. can definitely utilize if we're looking in that direction. Okay. So in terms of that, yeah. um, I'm aware that at least one organization was, was the, did a soft check to see if there was some rental room for the campus itself. And we looked at and thought about well, the rent out. again, so the, the, uh, the ADA and upgrades and so forth that needs to happen in order to have occupancy of the Cedar Ridge. I'm not yet. thinking about the gym, I'm thinking more about the same, <coughs> same thing. Yeah. That's, that's one of the options to put on the table for the council is you know, do you want to spend a little money right now? Um, if it makes money, I guess that would be it. It's not going to make money. Let's I, sell I, that thing and see if we can afford our ADA ramp. ramp. I think you're really. <laughs> so what? I, I got a buyer <laughs> over here. <laughs> 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 the mayor wants it in his backyard. <laughs> or in the lake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tie the house post. Has the angler been up here to Carl to Little Sandy? Here we go. Over in the sewer. Have come in, I'm sorry. Have any community groups been approached to maybe like lease out the pool or operate the pool while <coughs> wow, the council makes a decision? No. I mean, um, are you talking about just like renting the pool or actually taking over full operations? Either way. Okay. 
I mean, I mean there's I'll, definitely. I'll, if you say rental, I mean like long term, maybe like a year. Oh, no, 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 no. I mean, there are like water polo groups and swim teams yeah, that would come in and, and, and you know, rent the mm -hmm. facility, but they're not going to, um, they, they are not interested in maintenance and that kind of thing. And no, I have not been approached by anybody that wants to manage it either. Nobody has anyone else $300,000 yeah. needed to operate it in the whole, not even us. Right. You know somebody? You got that look. <laughs> <laughs> the interesting, like the YMCA and other I don't need another project. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you mean like. I am interested in getting the pool up and running, though. <laughs> so are we. So, so are we. we. I know. I know. That's why we're all here. <laughs> all right. Okay, I was. Yeah, I was going to say something something. What did you do? Yeah. Sarah, you're back now. Your turn. You get double the amount of money now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Oh, bring back here to the This one? Yeah, that's it. Does anybody have any other questions for me? Don't press whatever button's on. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> what am I even pressing? Just, just that button. side one to move forward. Okay. Oh, okay. I don't know if you guys need to get to a different sheet or something. Oh, yeah, I do. What page are you on? Do you know? I'm going to start on page 40. 40. Well, we skipped over there. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so my name is Kelly O'Neill Jigger. I'm the planning and building director. Um, development services is the department I run. Thanks for it. Um, so within that department, we have three funds that I'm mainly going to talk about tonight. Three divisions. Um, planning. I put the code numbers behind them. So we got planning, building, and economic development. Um, we also, as we'll talk next Monday night, we also do a lot of the um, urban renewal programs and we currently are doing um, for about the last I think 13 months now 14 months um, helping with the parks board and helping with parks planning um, we're currently in the process of getting an RFP out there um, that Kathleen um, wrote a lot of the RFP I wrote a little she wrote a lot um, and so we're finalizing that and then hopefully we're going to get a consultant on in the next month or two um, and at about the same time we're going to be passing the board over to Tanya uh, hopefully, um, but it, you know, in doing so, I'm not going to just kind of pass it the buck and make you know that department do everything. I, I have told her that I'm still committed to following up and helping with the master planning process and helping with RFPs, um, helping with contractors because we do that a lot in my, in my department that I run. Um, and then, in addition to that, in uh, addition to urban renewal and that, we also do business licenses, um, OLCC permits, and some other odds and ends uh, like special event permitting and stuff on the city. Uh, we currently have 7.7 .7 FTEs, and that would be the same amount going forward into the next biennium. I did increase uh, my FTE count by about 1.7 uh, in the last in this last biennium. We were way understaffed in planning, uh, especially with the economy and how well things were moving out here. And then honestly, we were understaffed in our admin support services. We had two people up at the front counter, um, you know, and if one person's sick for a day or two, or one person wants to take a week vacation. It really just makes it very hard to operate our front counter uh, services that we provide. So it's a very unique budget in that we have 7.7 .7 FTEs, but um, portions of Mike's budget uh, budgets pay for um, I think a fourth of one of my FTEs. Um, you know, I think my budget pays for a fifth of um, an employee in Mike's department and maybe like an eighth of the code enforcement officer, Kevin Moody. So it is unique in that it's kind of spread amongst multiple different departments. And then also part of our FTE count is paid for by urban renewal, so as you'll see next week. So I, yeah. You, when you say seven, are you combining planning, building, and economic together as one? Exactly, yep. Okay. So, so yeah, I'm flipping between all these, looking at the budgets, trying to figure out which one you're talking about. Yeah, so 7.7 7 is myself, a building official inspector, two associate planners, um, David Snyder, the economic development manager, and then 
a permit tech who's at the front counter, a planning assistant, and then the other person who works 28 hours a week as an admin assistant. And then in addition to that, we've actually over the last year had somebody doing scanning services for us as a contract. However, she has uh, just told us that she won't be able to do that anymore starting like after this week. So. So city council goals in this department. I just wanted to touch on this real fast because there was like five or six goals that you guys set. Two of them were in this department. Transportation will be mainly in this department so we're, since we're kind of spearheading it, but we'll be getting a lot of participation obviously from Mike um, and also from Andy um, because they're very instrumental in the transportation systems plan update. Um, so it is a it is a multi-department goal really, but the because it's being spearheaded by my department this time around, I just wanted to include it in here. And then start to look at the comprehensive plan and how we're going to update that. Um, I don't have any current funding mechanism for that. There's about a $50,000 state grant is the most that I can find so far, but I want to explore that further. And you know, these plans usually cost two to 300000 to do. Um, so we'd be a little bit short. And so you have not currently budgeted for that? No, no. The TSP is currently budgeted for in full. Has it budgeted under planning or? Building. The TSP? Yeah. Well, most of that, about 165,000 of that's from ODOT. And then only about 10 is out of planning and about 30 is out of uh, transportation SDCs. It doesn't all of it have to come in and out of a budget? So it comes in as revenue and goes out as expense? Yeah, so I, yeah, we would probably take the $165,000 from ODOT and put it into planning. planning. But that's, that's not in the budget right now, that grant. So the one grant you found for the comp plan, what, what was the value on that? I think it has an upper limit of 50000 It's a DLC grant. So it's not it's not really that much, honestly. I mean, I wish it was more like the comp, the TSP where it was 150 to 60. Was there a lot out there? I know you said you haven't really looked around that. I haven't looked at any sense, so that had to look more. You know, we're planning to bring to the council the options and sort of the laying out what it would take to do the comp plan. <coughs> Moving on from there, uh, this is the planning budget. I don't know if there's any questions around that. I wasn't really going to speak to it. It's, um, we got a lot of money in fines, fees, and assessments, which is mainly planning fees and sign fees, and also erosion control fees. Uh, the general fund is uh, the taxes and anything else that comes out of there. Uh, the personal services, as I said, have went up rather extensively, and that's mainly because we hired another full-time associate planner this last biennium. Uh, I don't know if there's any questions beyond that. Do you see any increases coming down the pike? You know, we're getting a lot of momentum in the business and the, and the building part of the world. Do you see us getting stronger? And some people have said that after a couple of years we're talking maybe a recession, but from your viewpoint, are we getting more and more money from the things coming in, or do you think we're leveling out? What are you thinking about that? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, for instance. I'm far from an economist, but it, I have heard the same kind of things. I mean, we hear the same thing during, you know, your your real estate on the right planning. So we hear kind of from the same groups of people. I think. I'm concerned for you because I'm thinking, are we headed down? Are we headed flat? I'm not I mean, sure be so if we do if we do go way down, the one thing you always have to keep in mind is that is the excellent time to do long term planning, to okay. do code updates. Because mm -hmm. when you do a comp plan, that comp plan is going to say. Here's all the code sections that sure. need to be revised, and it's going to be extensive because our code's really old. So, but you don't have the money coming in from those plans either. Correct. So it'd be a decision: do you lay somebody off, or and not do any additional long-term planning, really? Yeah. Or do you start doing long-term planning at that point? Okay. And that's a, that's a decision every city has to face in the planning for. And it, you know, it depends on what kind of downturn it is. What, you know, uh, how long it lasts, and things like that too. And it, does it hit the housing oh. sector? I mean. 2008 was pretty unique and bad. <laughs> so it's hard to predict. So, with your science fees and assessments, I see 13, 15. Um, we, we brought in 230, 15, 17, brought in 249. We projected 199, but do we know where we're at given the biennium's almost over? And then we're projecting a $54,000 increase. Yeah, I don't, I don't know without looking at the numbers what the current total is. It's way over that fifty thousand dollar increase. What's way over that? The current. So the, the current seventeen nineteen is one ninety nine two forty one. I'm assuming you're going to be over that, but 
we're projecting a $54,000 increase that's higher than the previous two bienniums actuals. And I just, it, does, it looks weird that we projected a 199 unless those other numbers are. Yeah, our, our, currents, our currents at um, close to, oh wait, it's over that. It's over 300,000 right now. Okay. And we still have three so months. So 253 is a pretty safe estimate. Yeah, no, I, I took the it down. The 199 was a pretty low estimate. <laughs> well, by like 40%. Yeah, I plus. think there's, there's also, we may have a rate increase proposal too for some of the planning fees. Not much, 2%. Yeah. It's 2%. Okay. It's not going to make a huge increase. We get we got a bunch of big proposals that we had, I had no idea were coming. Basically, is where that came right. from. Okay. I know this is going to shock you. Have another question on the comp plan? <laughs> um, anybody else? Have <laughs> <laughs> I need to go to scan. Well, well, yeah, on the cost of uh, you said two hundred to uh, three hundred thousand, but it, you've also mentioned the. I mean, you guys are busy, right? So, like with your staff. So, is I mean, is it hiring? Would you have to hire additional staff and all that? Is that worked into the figure when you said that, or is that yeah. an additional? in addition to that. So the two ways to do the comp plan, as you would know, are you just hire the whole thing out, out yeah. or you hire a limited duration, like two-year planner. That's what a lot of cities do. <coughs> and then that person would probably, just based on earnings numbers there, would probably cost a couple hundred thousand dollars. And then in addition to that, you still do have to get some consultant work done. So that's worked into your number, though? Yeah. Cool. I was just getting from DLCD, and they were saying it's somewhere between two and 300000 for a city your size. Okay. And it's really, the, the big part of it is, how extensive the public outreach portion that we want to do. Mm -hmm. That's what really makes the, the numbers so varied. Jeremy? Yeah, thank, thank you, thank you, John. Um, so uh, just for the background for everyone else on the Planning Commission, I know a little bit uh, from being on the uh, Planning Committee that, that some of the stuff, numbers that you come in with uh, can only be spent within inside that department and only, you know, uh, with, uh, certain fees that come in can only be spent back in that department, is that correct? So like, kind of like SDCs can only be spent on certain aspects of... So that's the building department. That's the building, not the planning part of it. Correct. That, no. I don't know of any limitations. That okay, wrong, sorry, wrong fund on that. Unless Tyler knows us some, I don't, I don't think that is the case. Okay. You have to spend planning fees on planning. I might have been mixing it up with building. I, I think building. Um, yeah, so I know in the past that uh, that downturn, like Scott was always saying, you build that fund up for those ebbs and flows. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you carry over those, and which is great in our type of funding, is that we hold those true in those departments for those low times that you can take money for to do the planning that you're talking about. So in this, I guess, is that your contingency fund? Is that what that um, is, is the extra money that you I mean, there's in not your ebbs and flows? or? Are you spending all the money in the budget? There's not a lot in there, so I don't, you wouldn't be able to, if you look at the building fund, I'm trying to build it back up. Sure. So now it's at like, two, we'll get to that in a second, but it's at like 280 now, and it was at 220, and when I inherited it, it was at like 140 or 130. So I'm trying to build that right. one up for that very reason. Yeah. But this budget, um, I mean, this is basically based on a conservative approach of what it costs to run the department, essentially. And then the 60, what is it, 63,000? Yeah. Yeah, that's the money that we just have left over, so. You know, it's 11000 higher than the previous budget, but is it enough to write Right, out? so if we hit a downturn, we won't have enough to write out a year. Yeah. Yeah. Is that, that was where I was coming to back to. Is this, we, we have our contingency for our, our accounts, or the general fund, but learning from past experiences that that building that was such an up and down with the economy that it had its own in the past, and I know it probably was that low because of the big downturn we had in 2008. The building fund, yeah. Yeah, that I know that we had some stresses on that too, so. Okay. Yeah, it, I'll show you, it got over a million dollars from what I understand, and then it went all the way down to 100, 100,000. Wow. And I'm still so, trying to build it back. So from a million to, we're at 247? No, or are we at 62? No, 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 oh, let me get to the other budget, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. This, Wrong budget. <laughs> you're jumping between all these different bu uh, planning, building, and economics, so okay. Any more on this page? Um, I have a general question, maybe for Tyler or Jordan. Is it possible to get 17 and 19 actuals like here to date? We have. It just, um, it just seemed, it was just, you know, kind of brought to our attention that maybe some of these departments have completely overperformed or that, that we're maybe basing our <coughs> judgments off of numbers that are three years old. <coughs> Is the March poster? Yeah. Yeah. 
So March um, year to date numbers, or I guess biennium to date numbers are on the website. Okay. Um, and so you could take a look at those. I'll have April's up by May 10th. Uh, no, you're good. <laughs> I'm just looking right at you, but like two inches above your head. <laughs> uh, by May 10th. About May 10th. Um, I guess that's fine. I, I make that deadline. So maybe a suggestion for the next biennium is that we do have an actuals of it. So what I've seen is like a year to date or biennium to date spending and then estimated revenue or expense yeah. through the remainder of the year so you can at least see like where we're trying to save money because we don't do that at the college where we'll realize we're way underspent somewhere we're way overspent and we have a little bit of time left in the biennium to yeah I, I think um you know one thing to consider and this would be the body to consider is maybe like a, a mid-year or mid-biennium so like halfway through <coughs> like do a check-in and see where we're at the the the, the difficulty I have with showing estimates in the budget document is it's based off of, um, let's say we, you know, we're working on them in November, December. Um, we're actually, this is a condition of the human being, really bad at estimating. Even if we have 18 months of data, we're actually still kind of bad at projecting out like what's going to happen in the next six months, especially with like capital projects and stuff that roll through. Um, we, can, we can get pretty good with personnel and things like that, but materials are pretty bad. Um, and then it begs a lot of questions about estimating as opposed to what are you estimating for the actual new budget as opposed to focusing on the current year. Um, it's up to you guys whether you want to show. I just say that there's some pitfalls of showing the estimated column um, when we you know, are talking about a proposed budget versus the existing biennium. But I think I like the strategy of doing like a, a mid biennium check in and kind of a status report on where we're at, make adjustments if we need to. Um, kind of talk about how we're, how, how we're heading. Like that. You like your own debt idea? Yeah. Okay. I, I will let you know that at least, <laughs> at least on my budget, the so fines, fees, and assessments are based on. <laughs> just saying. They're based on actual projections. <laughs> and I'll add one thing also. So they are based on that. That beginning balance number that is in the proposed uh, 1921 column, that does take into effect all of our projections for the curve by an yeah. So. You, you get the end result without all the uh, cumbersome detail. I agree. When you're hearing the number is 300,000, that we see mm -hmm. on here at 199, it's, it, it's a kind of misleading. Especially when we're talking, you know, if there's 50,000 extra dollars there, mm -hmm. that can be used elsewhere. Yeah, so the, the 199, just so you guys know, that was based on that there's economists around the state when I made the last budget saying that the beginning of 2000, End of 2018, beginning of 2019, we're going to see a big drop off. So I just lowered, I just lowered it based on that, and obviously that didn't happen in San Diego. So uh, conservative, okay, correct. Yeah. Which can add to your building up that contingency, right. like that we talked about. So. so here's some fun stats: um, our land use applications, subdivisions, and pre-app meetings. Um, so as you can see, the pre the land use applications have really they basically doubled. Uh, well, in 2017, they did. Uh, 2018, the number was down a little bit, but we had way more big applications in 2018 than uh, 2017. So really, even though the number was down, the actual volume of work, I asked my staff about this, they think it increased. Um, and then subdivisions has, has been staying pretty steady, about two to three, uh, with the exception in 2015 we had five. Uh, but it's been about two to three every year, and I'm expecting a couple more this year coming up. Um, and then pre-app meetings have went crazy. Um, as you can see, the three highest years are all the last three years, and like this year is over triple it was when the economy was bad. Um, so there's a lot of interest in development, and that's a good indicator from the pre-app meetings, is the interest in development. You should have a column there for extensions. Because <laughs> <Well, laughs> I know when I first started on council, we were doing yeah. like one a month. I was like, what all those extensions? Yeah. Yeah. So, so in our club doesn't have a lot of that anymore, though. So if there's no more questions on planning, I'm going to jump right to building now. Okay, and here's the budget for building. Now this is where Jeremy was pointing out. As you'll see, we get all of our money here from beginning fund balance and fines, fees, and assessments. So this fund is 100% um, supported by the 
fees that we bring in basically for building plumbing and mechanical permits. Uh, Clackamas County still does electrical permitting. I was just a quick update on that. I was looking to get to do that this next biennium, but the amount of revenue we would produce would only pay for half of the expenditures of a position to hire electrical, so to, there's no way to float it. Yeah. Um, so is it more expensive to um, be able to contract out permits for like, I know plumbing, is, is that ours as well now too? Or? Plumbing, mechanical, and building, yeah. We have those three. Okay. And well, it's cheaper for us to contract those kinds of things than it is to employ. That that isn't that what Terry does? So are you saying would it be cheaper to contract yeah. it out okay. and yes. not have employees? Right. Not for plumbing. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. I think it would be more expensive. Cla for example, Clackamas County charges us 115 an hour. It just sounded like you said the electrical was far better to, to uh, do the uh, contracting than it was to do employee. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, through Clackamas County. So Clackamas County, when I said, oh, we're, oh, interest you were saying. Oh, they, we're interested in taking over electrical, they were very, yeah, sure. And then I found out the reason why is because then they shared all their books with me. And <laughs> it's a money loser for them. So they're, you know, if they bring in 60, I think it's, this is about what they do. If they bring in 60 grand in revenue per year, they're paying 120 uh -huh. in expenses. Mm -hmm. So that's why they were so eager to say, yeah, you guys can have this. You know, want this <laughs> and then I said, no, nah, you guys can hold on to it for the time being. So, okay. um, so as Jeremy was pointing out, this budget, the reason why the contingency is at 280 is I would love that to be more than a million or more. Mm -hmm. Because as soon as the economy goes down, this you know this budget doesn't get zero from taxes or anything else. So. And this is what you said was at a million back before the. Economy. That's what I've heard from my predecessors. I you know I, I wasn't yeah. around obviously then, but um, I heard it was around a million, yeah. and then it got. I do know. Tyler could probably give the better numbers, but I do know it got under a hundred at one point. Yeah, I remember those times. It was. Right. Not fun. I can't pull those numbers in 20 seconds, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that involves Greg turning on a really old server and <laughs> jumping through a lot more hoops. So hey, well. If you want them, I can get them, but it will take some time. Yeah. Here's some fun data. Um, building permits, plumbing permits, mechanical, um, single family home. So a lot of this spiked in 2015, and that's because we had a lot of lots available. Uh, right now we have, I think, Platted lots in the city of Sandy, we have 18 that can build a single family home. It's like nothing. Mm -hmm. um, it's basically like we have zero, essentially. We may have a downturn just because we don't have lots Exactly. Of and that's what I factored into when I was doing the budgeting for building, is I think we're going to have a slight dip this next biennium just because we don't have any lot availability. Um, we do have about 130 to 150 lots coming on uh, for building potential in about the next year. They're all being built right now. If you go, you know, uh, Sandy Bluff neighborhood has one. There's two down by Bornstead. Mm -hmm. There's another one by the cemetery over here. So we are going to see a lot of houses still. But I think for the next two to three years, unless we get a real big subdivision proposed, we're only going to get probably about 50 to 60 houses a year. We're not going to be at that 120 number. Mm -hmm. But as you can see, the apartment dwellings have really went up. And we've already issued another 40-something this year uh, apartment dwellings. Uh, this is something I shared last biennium. I just want to share it again since we have so many new faces. And this is basically what it costs when you pull a building permit out of the front counter. You pay about twenty-one dollars to $24,000 in fees. But this is what you're actually paying for. The orange area is the only money. 15% of that $23,000 goes back into this fund. The other 85% goes to SDCs, 1% of planning. SDCs make up 55%, parks fee in lieu of land 8%, mm -hmm. school excise 10, um, and then so on. But so I just wanted to point this out that very little, only 15% is actually going to pay like indirect support costs and personal expenses within mm -hmm. my apartment. And the, and the pie on the SDCs will only get larger here once we have the new uh, system development charges for sewer that are coming up. So the the 15% will probably get out to like 12%. Moving right along, economic development. Um, as I think Stan pointed out, a big chunk of the general revenue has been reduced in this fund. Um, that's being basically supplemented by urban renewal. Uh, David is David Snyder, the economic development manager, is doing more and more urban renewal projects. So more of his salary we put forth into uh, their urban renewal. 
this is kind of a smaller budget. I do want to point out a few uh, things in here. We do have materials and services, which is very misleading. It's $99,000. Um, $60,000 of that $99,000, I'll talk about one in one second here. And then here's some fund development data facts. Uh, facade grants, that's what we've been doing, just to give you guys a heads up. We're now doing these infrastructure grants, too, that I, I didn't get the numbers for. And then business licenses, while David doesn't issue business license, he does participate in getting people up and running and, and making sure they have business license. As you can see, we spiked in 2016. We're down a little bit, but pretty close still. And uh, compared to what it was like in the de economic downturn, we're up uh, you know, 120, 130 businesses in San Diego. A lot of those are home businesses. Yeah, a lot of them, yeah. And then this is one thing I want to... Oh, sorry. We're, we're still on economic development. Yeah. yeah. Um, what is the um, contribution to SSCP for sixty thousand? Yeah, that's what I was going to talk about on the next slide. Great oh, segue. Okay. Great segue. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I really had to go to my source on this one. I really had to go to David. Um, you know, before two thousand eight, beginning of two thousand eighteen, he wasn't actually even in my department. He was being run out of the city manager office and. Kim had decided to switch that into my department because it was the only non-department head directly reporting to the city manager and she just wanted to kind of streamline that process a little. And there's a lot of interconnections between economic development and planning the building. Um, so this is this is a this $60,000 is a program developed by Seth Atkinson in 2015. And I was not the department at the time, but I did hear kind of what kind of went on and Jeremy and Carl and whoever else was here at the time can probably fill it in better. But it's basically funding that we give to like Ant Farm, the Chamber of Commerce, the Historical Society, um, and the Community Action Center, and it's fifteen thousand dollars to each one of those. Now, it could be allocated slightly different because the applications are due every year. Um, but basically, what was happening, I think, Jeremy, you can fill in blanks, but they were coming and requesting money from the yep. city, and instead of the city continually getting these different requests at random council meetings, mm -hmm. they decided to just make a program and allocate that. That's exactly right. Okay. 100%. Yeah, we're, come, we're getting them all the time. Come out of general fund, come and we decide to streamline it into one so it can be fair for everybody. So this 60000 is, if you look back at this budget, it's kind of, that's part of the 242 that David gets. Sixty grand is just going basically into his department. He manages the grants, and then the 60000 just moves right back out. So 60000 of that's not really part of the operational cost for economic development. It's just for that grant mechanism. Did you have other questions around that, yeah. okay. And that pretty much ends my summary. If anybody has any other questions before I step away. Going, going, going. Thank you. Right. <laughs> Might come back up to the perks thing here. Uh, sure, yes. <laughs> Mr. Mike. You can jump to page 53 in your handout if you'd like. If you haven't got there yet. Um, we skipped over uh, parks maintenance, but we can come back to that. Page 41. Um, so, yeah, thank you for all uh, coming tonight. And to show my appreciation, I'm not going to subject you to a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, <laughs> In big fashion, yay. <laughs> so this will be an audio-only presentation. You know, we'll just follow along. On Can I get a transcript of that, please? <laughs> These sewer plants. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and this is one thing on, on all the um, PW funds, you know, I'm trying to make a distinction between the services. We want to run very lean with as far as full-time staff. We contract out for a lot of services, and so that's really where the difference is. I don't think you'd find many cities this size and have you know six FTEs and public works. So um, a lot of that is a result of contract. Yeah. You know. So the street fund, you know, some of the stuff we contract out the street fund are striping, you know, paving, street sweeping, and street light maintenance. And um, so we have about 38 center line miles of streets. And uh, some of the significant costs in the uh, operating budget, like all the PW funds, it's split into an operating budget and a capital budget. Um, the, one of the biggest costs is um, st uh, power costs for street lights and traffic signals. You know, ODOT um, owns and 
you know, controls the time on the traffic signals, but we have to pay for power costs. Um, and so one of the things we're looking at, we actually, it's underway this year, and it'll be continued over into the um, next biennium, is to, we, the council approved the uh, energy savings performance contract um, earlier this year. Uh, we, we're using a firm called McKinstry, and they're going to evaluate the cost of converting all of our streetlights, there's about a thousand of them. To LED technology, and with the savings from that, he, uh, we should be able to cover the debt service to cover the cost of the conversion. So, you know, the conversion might cost two million dollars, and the debt service might be, you know, two hundred thousand a year, and we should hope to save that much in the power cost. A question for you, Mike, because we brought this up years ago, and PGE only had these different programs, A, B, C, tracks or whatever, and we said, what, if we saved money, we'd still be charged the same amount at that time? Did they change the program? They did. They, they, there is now a rate tariff for non-PGE streetlights, you know, streetlights owned by the city. Mm -hmm. So there is an incentive now to convert to LEDs. Before there was not, right. because okay. you were only saving uh, PG money. Yeah, you weren't saving yourself any money. So that's one. That's one of the you know a big cost driver in the street fund, and so we're looking at uh, doing that. And we'll be able to do more with the street lights. You know, we'll, we'll use uh, uh, you know like we use our wireless. You know, the antennas we already have for the standing that wireless service to you know turn these things on mm -hmm. and off. And uh, we won't we'll add photo cells, which are kind of a weak link in a street light. So Mike, um, how, I always forget. Is it this? Uh, the city that owns all those two by six type uh, lamps, street lamps, or is it the PGE? Well, the city owns about a hundred of those. I think PGE's replaced all of the wooden posts, and we are going to replace 50 of the uh, wooden posts in this planning and 50 of the following. And that's part of that LED thing that we're looking at? Yeah, we probably will look at, you know, just once we get the contractor on board, we're just placing the on those replacing the light soles or replacing the poles. <coughs> how, many, how many of those wooden things do you think they have? 96, 97. Is that all? Mm -hmm. no, That's all they have. Yeah, they were, they were popular at one time, but they, they weren't very, they don't last very long. Greg can tell you, one's falling down this weekend. I think it's what he says. Yeah. Oh, it's been doing That's why the antenna was straight for the poles like that. Well, that's part of the thing, too. Sandy Nets hanging all their. Uh, hardware on them that they can make it for you. They're not using it anymore. Hey Mike, a quick question. So uh, for the ability to turn off individual street lights, is there any chance that might be a place We, we hope to have that ready by the holiday, holiday season. season. <laughs> <laughs> or at least I know in neighborhoods you can probably prioritize uh, that. Uh, or at least uh, a uh, BB gun can't reach the demo light in one neighborhood in particular. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and then, you know, the, uh, we have a project to um, build a pedestrian connection from the west end of Vista Loop Drive to Tenike Road along I on the north side of Highway 26. And uh, we just selected the design consultant, and uh, we're having a scope meeting tomorrow with ODOT to kind of pin down the scope. That's, it's, you know, it's these, a uh, lot of these uh, ODOT. Uh, not really grants, but you know, if you get your project in the statewide transportation improvement program, that sounds great. But you know, this is a project we scoped and estimated in 2011 for the 2015-18 plan, and you know now it's projected to go to uh, construction in 2020. So you know, an estimate we thought was a pretty good number in 2011 is now like really a bad number, and the cities have to increase their contribution. To about $900,000. Uh, but you know, we've had good funding uh, between you know the state gas tax money. Uh, you know, we've had a, so we're we'll able to cover that of our allocation of state gas tax. It shouldn't be much of a share. And the local gas tax uh, is a, another revenue source, but that's primarily devoted to street maintenance projects, overlays, things like that. We, and the council can do with it whatever they want. I think one penny was sold to the voters as street maintenance, and the other penny of it was open-ended, so, but right now we're using it all for street maintenance. We, we council see a contract, uh, award a contract for May 20th meeting for the uh, 2019 uh, street overlay program. We're not keeping up though, right? It's just, uh, yeah. No, we're keeping, you know, right around, you know, everything in kind of the good category. You know, they, we use a, a payment condition index uh, called 
PCI, and uh, ideally you want to be between like 80 and 90 on that. And uh, I think we're in the low 80s on that. We'll, we'll pick up this year. We, you know, we, we, some years we just get zero bids on our slurry seal contract because we don't, we don't have enough to interest anybody to come out here. This year we've kind of saved up two years of uh, projects and we have one big contract and we've got three very solid bids on that. So, uh, so some years, you know, we, we do a lot of expensive projects. And some years we do, I mean, a few very expensive projects and some years we do a lot of cheap, you know, very inexpensive projects. So some years there's stuff going on all over town. Other years might only be two or three streets. Yeah. If we were to get the VRF money, is that enough money that we would have to do a supplemental budget, or would it still fall? Uh, no, I think um, I think we have that revenue in here. Uh, no, the collections are pretty. It's oh, that's right. The yeah. collections would be till eighteen mm -hmm. months from yeah, now, or right. something mm -hmm. like that. Um, so we didn't include it in so the budget, but we could. Like if, six months. If we got updated information about how much we can expect in this biennium, then and we wanted to start spending that I think we would want to wait to get some mm -hmm. uh, information about how much we're collecting before we do anything like that okay. against I did count our chickens before they hatch. yeah 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 I mean that's that's you know one of the goals of the council had was the and this was mentioned in Jordan's budget matches was the uh, Bell Street expansion of the connection with 362 and highway 26 and so this biennium we're going to fund uh, out of cash reserves of the street fund we're going to fund um, the design the uh, right of way acquisition, uh, the environmental permitting, and any legal uh, costs out of that. And then and we've got three million budget for that. And then in the following biennium, once we know that the we can rely, you know, that the uh, vehicle registration fee will not be subject to an initiative petition, mm -hmm. and then the, uh, the the transportation bill that the legislature passed in 2017. Uh, that they, that's ramped in over six years, and uh, we won't see the full results of that the allegation until 2023. But between the vehicle registration fee and the increase in the uh, fuel tax, uh, that is about $400,000 a year in, and that will cover about $5 million of debt service. And so between the cash we have built up now and the $5 million, that should cover the estimated project cost of the Bell Street expansion. Right. I, I, I know your next couple of conversations about the sewer plan that I guess you're going to be talking about. There's a lot of stuff <clears throat> in our streets, I'm assuming, that are going to be those sewer pipes that we're going to be looking at the I and I. How does that affect our road fixes? Because you're going to be doing a lot of tearing up and then replacing. How is that going to mess in the next couple of years? Well, we try and match to that. You know, we don't like to tear up streets, you know, you know, the year after you've been paid. But a lot of you know a lot of the work you can you do is combined though know, it makes things better if oh. you focus on the roads that are really going down you know and replace with those that pavement that you're digging up because you're digging up pipes. Yeah, but uh, you know you would, that's that's built into the estimates for the sewer uh, collection system one, is the surface restoration. So and also you know, there's a lot of stuff you can do with sewers that don't require you to dig up the street. There's a lot of trenchless things you can do that you don't need to take out the street to replace a sewer pipe. But you will be tearing up some streets. My guess is there'll be some pipes that are broken. We've seen some of those right. indications. Yeah, we just don't know where those are yet. You know, that's part of the, not, we can get into this one to discuss the sewer yeah, I don't want to cross but, line, but, you know, that's, that's, that's a consideration. Once we know where we need to concentrate our efforts, then we can adjust our street pavement, paving program. Kind of anticipate that. Well, we, this street is scheduled for this year, but we know we're going to have to dig it up next year, push it off for two years. So, yeah, we keep that in mind. Um, so, um, let's see here. Oh, and then in 2020, we do every five years we hire a firm out of Salem to come and do a condition uh, assessment on our street system. They drive all all the streets in the town, come up with a condition rating, and then give us a um, Recommended treatment for each street segment, and so we last time we did this was in 2016, and so uh, this year is the last year of the condition assessment. We'll start a new one in 2020, and then they'll, they'll give us projects for the next five years, and, and help us prioritize um, how the uh, 
local gas tax would be spent. Um, that's really um, all I have. We're going to have a lot of street work. You know, the, the contract that you'll see on the 20th, uh, there's a lot of streets involved. In that. And so it's going to be a busy summer. They, they have, you know, we have a bluff for the project. That's another thing that's weird about the street fund is that you know you bid out projects. We did our 2018 street paving program. We did that out in the fall. We, you know, we had a pretty nice fall. We thought we'd be able to get that all done in uh, 2018, but it, it carried over, so we would actually be doing it in 2019. So you know, the paving, the season for paving is split by the uh, you know fiscal year, and so some projects carry over. You know, depending on whether you don't get them done in, in the fall. We have work left over in during the fall and spring, you know, the summer, and so that's split by the planning. So it doesn't always line up perfectly, but there will be a lot to that going on this summer. All right, what's next? Sewer? Transit. Good. Carpet <laughs> <Our little brain. laughs> here. <laughs> Uh, you don't want to do the mic show right now? <laughs> no, I was going to You're going to come back? Mm -hmm. We have several, Hello. so. <laughs> Good evening. Are you going to bore us with the PowerPoint? I am. <laughs> yeah, well, we love your PowerPoint. Really <laughs> <laughs> um, I have no idea. 57. 57. 57. Thank you. This one. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm Andy Howell from the Transit Director. And I actually um, focus most of this on my big ticket items that are happening in this biennium. I didn't talk a lot about the services we provide. As most of you in here already know, we did add to um, our service starting in January because we have the new STIF funds coming our way. Uh, but I don't foresee until um, we finish our transit master plan, which we are almost in the middle of at the moment, um, making any big changes to our routes. So I didn't concentrate necessarily on our service, but to let you know that we do provide service to Gresham, which everyone should know. Um, last year, that, that service gave about 99,000 rides. Um, SAM overall gave about 128,000 rides. You also see um, vehicles in town labeled STAR, that's our dial-a-ride service that gets you from point A to point B in town. And then we have a service to Estepeda. We have a brand new shopper shuttle, which is doing really well. And um, we also have, a, not everyone knows this, but we have um, a medical rides program. So if you are frail, elderly, or disabled, we will. <laughs> Take you. <laughs> Take you. <laughs> you <laughs> <laughs> you're volunteering. <laughs> oh, I thought you said we're a participant in the program. <laughs> well, I think that's what he was doing. <laughs> yeah, Come on. Yeah. We will take you to uh, medical appointments that are not available in town. So a lot of that is to the um, Portland area, which is you, uh, Russian hospitals, things of that nature. However, tonight, um, so in most of my budget, as far as our services, similar to Mike, we have about 30 employees that are contracted. So our drivers, our dispatch, um, our operations team is contracted to a company called Rojoy. So um, those costs are reflected in here, but when you see salaries, um, that is myself, a, tro a transit program administrator, and a transit assistant. So there are 2.8 City of Sandy Transit staff. Our budget looks a little bigger than usual this year. Is this a strategy the later in the night we get it gets smaller? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on my third dinner. So if you can see that, um, and you have it in front of you, so you probably don't need to see it, but we do have um, quite a few capital projects happening this year. So I just condensed my goals up here to concentrate on the big things that we have happening um, at Transit in the next two years. We have um, two bus barns being built, and we have a wash bay that needs repair, and while we're in there, we're looking at going ahead and, and making some upgrades and possibly making that an automated 
system so the driver can just drive through at the end of the evening. Um, mm -hmm. We also are purchasing seven vehicles. I'll get to that later. Seven? Yes. You say seven? I said seven. <laughs> These are all non general fund monies, right? These are all federal. Revenue. Yes, I should start I with that. the fact that I take zero general revenue. Yeah. Woo! -hoo! We love you. Yeah, I know. So can I just go home now? <laughs> Is out. <laughs> exactly. She loans everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, there, there is a transit tax in the city of Sandy, which most of you are aware of, and we um, are very thankful for that, and we are supported by that transit tax. We use that transit tax to leverage local, state, and federal grants. Um, we have planning projects happening. Like I said, we are in the middle of updating our transit master plan. It's going very well. I'm very happy with the process. Hopefully, um, we might have some new route designs come out of that, um, that project. Also, um, I mentioned that we have new STIF funds. Those funds require that we have enhancement plans done every two years and that we go we take those before the public and um, get feedback so hopefully from our transit master plan and that public process we will also have a new enhancement plan to know what we want to do with our STIF funds two years after these two years and then also with those new funds we are um, looking at technology improvements i think most of you know that we just put tablets on um, our vehicles most of our vehicles not the ones that take people to medical appointments that's going pretty well there's some technical glitches um, we also put them on mount hood express vehicles and um, the cell towers don't always work when you're on timberland road so um, there's some glitches and we're working through it, but we've um, gotten a lot of data. We were actually, um, we've switched. We used to pencil and paper our riders and our counts and what categories they belong in and now it goes right into a tablet. We know immediately we can run speed reports. Um, so if somebody says your vehicle looked like it was going too fast, we can pull up the past six months and say when, where, and um, give a report about it. So it's actually, and we've, We've used that quite a few times because um, I think sometimes buses look like they're going faster than mm -hmm. they really are. Or if they're supposed to be somewhere and they're not. Yes, we can look it up. We know their route. Uh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. There's a yeah. GPS uh, app that I have on my, my phone that I can watch. Determine when they're coming close and run out there in the rain. And yep. That is it. That is it. Or you can watch it sit in the, um, <laughs> in the opposite or not on its route. Where you're out in the freezing snow. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there, there is that. So I wanted to put this on here um, because one, I am not, um, I do not get funds from general revenue and so I wanted to highlight this. This is my transit tax and right now that is coming in fairly well because we're in a good economy. This is all the funds coming in. What actually usually happens is in operating is we use about 30 to 40 percent of this as match for our grants that we bring in and the rest is is how we build our contingency for the rainy day and the capital projects and some of those capital projects are about to happen so can i ask a question yes um since we started the transit tax since day one mm -hmm. um we've had it now we have front my wife pays it she teaches piano and pays this transit tax so we're, we're part of the members of paying that have we ever raised that? We've never raised it. And how long we've we been in service? It's about to be 20 years. 20 years, we've never raised that. Do you know how many times? Yes. I'm making a point here. And TriMet. And raised how much has TriMet raised yeah. theirs in the past? It, it raises annually. <clears throat> annually. Yes. So currently, if if That's City cool. of Sandy had remained in TriMet's district mm -hmm. um, and continued with that rate, um, you would be spending about 20%. Your payroll tax than you do. It's actually a good deal for I'm in real estate, you might pay the tax as a tax every year. That's why I was saying shh, I didn't mean to shush you. But I don't think it's that much, but I mean, uh, and, and so her piano is teaching, thing, no one rides it, but I mean, it's part of the community. It's great. Yes, thank mm -hmm. you. Anyway, it, it is a good uh, deal for us because if we were to pay like metros, it would be well, 30, 40 percent more. Believe me, I've looked. It's cheap compared to that. So. Not that I'm but wanting to inflation has up, happened, but so is that something we should be looking at? But you know, 
don't put a stake in it. I, I, in think, it. I think before you raise the rate, one thing we might want to look at is that the city of Canby actually um, taxes their urban growth boundary, not just their city limits. And city of Sandy currently only taxes city limits. Okay. So, um, So, I mean, there are other options that we can look at before we think about right? I just look at all the other fees that we've done over the years. We just don't ever. Why are they? Because they don't have the city limits. There's not much employment outside of the city limits. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Could we consider adding like USB charging to those Absolutely. stations? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, we did look into something similar to that. The transit center has um, outlets so that people can charge their phones, etc. So we have been looking at, there's a new type of outlet that you can plug a wheelchair, a power chair into that also has USB ports. So I mentioned um, that we are buying new vehicles, so I wanted to give an, a, a really visual aspect of it. If you see up top, those are our Gillig's that we run on the Gresham. Technically right now, one of our Gresham vehicles is not a Gillig, but it's getting replaced. This is actually a picture of our Gillig um, in production at the Gillig factory, or as soon as it was complete. So those vehicles run the Sam Gresham route. Um, this vehicle here, which isn't really ours, but looks just like it, uh, runs the Estacada route. These two are our star vehicles that you see running around town, and these two are our vehicles that run people into their doctor's appointments, and all of these vehicles are being replaced in the next two years. Oh, Yay. Um, the two Gillies, the city council has already approved the procurement, and they are supposed to arrive in December of this year, and city council has already approved the procurement of these two star vehicles and I believe we should have them in the next four months. They probably have sell those, right? The old ones? Yes. Yep. So yes. wait, the one big blue guy is at the facility ready, but it takes us till winter to get here? No, this oh, okay. this this <laughs> one in the picture was delivered in January of sixteen, I believe. Oh, okay. I look at Brittany. Because she knows more about my buses than, than she should. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is just a picture of our bus barn. We currently have one. This is what is being constructed, and um, this is the main project for my project manager. The bus barn that is planned, they are actually six, they're for six cutaways and six minivans. This is for 40-foot um, diesel heavy duty. Um, they are not currently planned to have doors on them. However, I did put some cushion in this budget because I was worried that the prices from 2014 were probably different now. Um, and I heard from my project manager that he thinks with the price I put in my budget, we could probably put on doors. So I'm hoping that actually does happen. This is currently our bus wash. I have a grant um, to replace the, there's a lot of, um, there's some filters. It, so this bus wash actually um, recycles water. Um, it's a very fancy bus wash, right, Mike? Um, anyway, <laughs> however, it's um, requiring a lot of maintenance lately, so we need to replace some filters, we need to replace some pipes, we need to replace the power washer, etc. I have a grant for that. While we're in there, however, I have added um, a, a significant amount of money to my budget to see if we can go ahead. I need to enclose at least one side of it. The way it is situated, it becomes a wind tunnel in the winter. Super painful to wash buses at 11 o'clock at night when they pulled off a route um, in the in the wind and rain. So we, I had planned to put a door on it, um, but I believe we can just enclose it all and make it automated. Could we rent that to? Yes. Like other services. Or built in washers. School buses? So I could see a Carl's car. No. So, are there any questions? That's all I have. I had one question, and that was, um, are you planning on adding any other services? I know you've added some routes, you know, up the mountain with some other grants. Everything's with the grant and things, but to Estacada, and you did your shopper trolley, and, you know, is there another shopper trolley, you know, is there any other areas that you're looking at being able to pull in money um, in the next biennium? Um, I do. Uh, 
Yes, so I do have an eye on a little pocket of money that um, I'm hoping we could maybe possibly, if it comes out of our master plan, um, put a shuttle directly to the community college. Nice. Um, All right, that's my number one thing since I went in place. Didn't go Which there. community college? Clackamas. <laughs> 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 Um, but they actually, in, the in the master plan, are talking about several different routes. Um, right. They're talking about going through Boring and Damascus straight to Oregon City. Yeah, there's another one. Boring has reached uh, out asking for service, but Boring it never has worked out time wise. Right. Um, asking us to for service, yes. So, um, but again, that will all have to come out of the master plan. We did add a new loop to the shopper shuttle with our new funding. Um, we did add to Estacada. It is already in our plan to add another run onto Estacada's current route. There's, we're only going five times a day. It's not really a lot. So, yes, I have lots of plans. I just have to work them out. Good job. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, anything else? So it is after 9 o'clock. Um, you know, do you want to keep driving through and, and finish the tour? We have yeah, and uh, maybe we could do really parks, brief and have sewer, questions. wastewater. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? And same net. Okay, we're gonna do this one fast. <laughs> That's those are scary. Last Challenge. <laughs> 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 that usually yeah. means we'll get you with questions. Yeah. So the uh, alternative is next week we finish up. Right. Okay. How? Uh, how long do we expect Urban Renewal to go? I mean, for a guy who's just my first budget process, right? It's pretty quick. Now, so pretty quick. Pretty, it's a pretty yeah. quick yeah. one. Yeah. Well, is that also on the schedule for next week? Yeah. By the way, nobody please mention the Blazer Games work because uh, you're taking. Uh, you're gonna watch it from the beginning. <laughs> so the other alternative is um, we could quickly, you know, just do my brother. Does anyone have any questions about uh, parks, buildings, and grounds? You know, and, and um, you know, do really an abbreviated, because we're wasting, you know, spending time talking about the abbreviated <laughs> process. I don't really like it. I would. I, so, I, I might be. I mean, it won't throw their clue at me, but I, I like to kind of process through a couple more of these. So, spoken like a true former planning commissioner. Mm -hmm. I like to go to the <laughs> one or two in the morning and get well, to My concern like, though is, is I want to make sure that we have the brain band bandwidth to give these departments their full due, right? And so, honoring that they've sat through three plus hours of meetings and anticipating presenting. So I'm really looking at Sandy that because everybody else is cutting the top. Yeah, you've had it. No, I'm not. You know, Stan's eyes are bleeding right over there. He's so tired. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, it doesn't help yeah, that. A week ago, they were literally <laughs> bleeding. <laughs> this one? Yeah. Three minutes. So what okay. if we wait until right. 9.30? What would it require us to do next Monday? Um, any departments that are left and then deliberate the on the budget. Oh, and so, so if we stopped at 9.30, we got plenty of time Okay, folks that still have to present, you got eight. I just feel bad for the ones that have sat here the yeah. whole time. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's yeah. Like, yeah. great. Yeah. Like, we'll, so, do, we'll do a time check. I'll do this one in three so minutes and then you can ask questions. Okay, so <laughs> Parks Capital Budget, it's payment fit, uh, in lieu of land. So if you don't dedicate land, you have, you have to pay uh, an amount instead in lieu of dedicating the land. We have system development charges, which are the um, improvement portion of the park. So that's what actually plays for playgrounds, um, you know, the spray pad here, dog shelters or dog uh, parks and shelters, stuff like that. And then we have land acquisitions, which is the opposite of the payment of, uh, in lieu of land. Um, I don't know about the capital outlay. If so we have zero FTEs. Um, we don't have anybody assigned currently to operations uh, right now out of this budget. Right now planning's doing some and then it's gonna be past the Tanya and then planning's gonna help out uh, where needed. Previously uh, I'll just throw in one thing. Uh, there was a transfer from the general fund into the parks capital fund to pay for um, the, you know, some planning services that were being done. That's just being absorbed now in the planning budget and not transferring general fund money here. It was like forty three thousand yeah. dollars this thing. You said there wasn't an FT increase because it shows an FTE increase. To, from 2.28 to 3.13. Are you on? Yeah, you're on parks, parks maintenance, not parks capital. Man, you're always ahead, Jeremy. 
So the project. We're on page 63. So the projects for this biennium are the Parks Master Plan and SDC methodology. Um, designing Deer Point Park and Champion Village Park, uh, potentially purchasing additional land within the city of all parks, um, constructing a second dog park somewhere on the south end of town, because we already have one on the north, and exploring options for extending the Tickle Creek Trail corridor more. Here's the resources. Even smaller. smaller. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> We're not. you guys have so that it's probably tied to the time, too. It's after night at Collect Something. The main summary on this is we have huge beginning balances. Um, Those are not then, huge. <laughs> well, they're over a million dollars, one of them, yeah. And one of them is 700000 And then we have um, projections. And then we uh, have some expenses related to doing uh, 200000 for the parks master plan and then those individual master plans. And then also some expenses related to park improvements. Are those neighborhood SDCs, do they have to be used specifically for those neighborhoods? No. They can be used for anywhere in the city limits on any park improvements. Kathleen? Yeah, um, it shows uh, like $150,000 to Ornstead Park. Um, anybody else see that? I don't. I'm trying to find it right now. Page 65. Yeah, it's on the page 65. At, at, it kind of third, third line down. Yeah, it's on the third budget line from the bottom. Or it's just park 150. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so and that's there, that's covered shelters and bathrooms. Kind of getting loud in your own, Kathleen. You guys are partying too hard. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I have six women out here watching the Blazer game. <laughs> <laughs> well, we know at 9.15 something important happens, so. Oh. <laughs> you can't stop at me for not being Budget committee meeting. Uh, yeah, so that was my question. Can somebody else ask, can that money go to any parks? And, and you're targeting it to Bornstead Park. Is that something that's going to come out of the master plan? Or is that something that's already been decided? Or, or what? Uh, that was for allocation of the shelters that we're looking to install, probably bathrooms and other improvements as identified in the parks master plan. I mean, they don't have to be used in Bornstead Park, but it's just it was a way to kind of budget appropriately. Okay. Yeah, it's kind of a line item. Yeah, exactly. Holding spot. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, I think I think that's all I have. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and then the two hundred thousand for the oh. uh, master plan. Yeah. Yeah, master plan, and then about thirty to forty thousand for each of the individual park master plans. Sure. And so one of the questions I also had was, um, it has the um, in, under the revenue, like, and this is just small potatoes, but the you know gazebo revenue and things like that. Shouldn't those be going into more park operations budgets rather than the CIP stuff? Uh, um, in the current biennium, the 1719 biennium, that's where the gazebo rental revenue is going. That's not the case um, for the proposed budget for okay. 1921. Okay, I just, it, yeah, it's not showing anything, so I'm just curious where that money might go in the future, and it's not a lot. But I think it's the community services department. Is there the one that does okay. the rental on it? it right, exactly, that's kind of what I thought. Okay, that's great. Not my department. So maybe a follow up to find out where that money is flowing to. There might be a lot of money in that fund. Citywide beer fund. Yeah, I think uh, we just didn't budget the two thousand dollars that gazebo rental will bring in. So we did have a conversation about that. Okay, revenue highlights. So as I already said, significant beginning fund balances and anticipated uh, Another biennium of growth and increased revenue based on development, so, you know, apartments, single family homes, that kind of stuff. That's what brings in money into this account, is my use of development. Mm -hmm. So once we get the master plan done, then we can start spending down the balances. Correct. And then the expenditure highlights are cost for master plan, cost for other park designs, land purchases probably around Tickle Creek mainly, second dog park. Or, or anything else that's defined in the Parks Master Plan and decided by council to be improved, basically. That's all I have. All right. Any other questions for Kelly? Oh, moving on, Mike, you're back up. 
Water and my favorite thing. Did you bring any samples? Wait a minute. Your wife's in Hawaii and you're here? You, you, have have to, you have to have two X chromosomes to go on. <laughs> <laughs> I don't qualify. Yeah, but for Kathleen, it's only 618 in the evening. Yeah, right. <laughs> I saw those fish and she had to get on at three. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we can do water and sewer in one shot. Um, sewer is a lot of uh, uh, big expenses coming up. It's not in this way, in, in the following way. Uh, the sewer uh, fund budget is predicated on a couple of things uh, a 6% rate increase, and that's just a number we threw at it. Uh, we'll know the, uh, we have a, uh, a uh, water rate uh, model update and a um, wastewater SPC update uh, on the contract right now. So hopefully by the end of um, June we'll have a good idea of what the uh, kind of the long-term financial picture is for the uh, sewer fund and where we need to be with um, rates in the next five years. And a lot of that's de dependent on the um, actual cost of the project and the um, type of financing we're eligible to get. So there's a lot of variables in there. <clears throat> and we haven't had a rate increase in either the sewer or the water fund since 2017. We did have one scheduled last year, but there was a decision to pull that off uh, the schedule. And uh, so now we're going to wait until we get our uh, rate model updated to actually do the work. And hopefully we'll be able to get something in place in early in this upcoming biennium. Uh, and then the other thing is predicated on is some of the capital projects uh, is dependent on receiving a uh, state revolving fund loan from a Department of Environmental Quality for $6.2 million. And that will help us do all the um, condition assessment improvements at the wastewater treatment plant that are in the uh, wastewater facilities plan and about $4 million worth of work in the collection system, the piping system, which is a big part of the issue at our sewer treatment plant. Is very leaky every time it rains. You know, we had that heavy rain in the middle of April and just really messed things up at the sewer plant. We had six million gallons one day and like nine the next. And uh, so we, you know, we got to get a handle on the collection system and seal that up. And we have you know, spent a lot of money on the collection system, but what we found out is that uh, a lot of times you can fix all the pipes in the road or the right of way, and it's the pipes on private property that are causing the problem. And so now the next step would be kind of identify the worst basins and then go into those areas and determine whether it's the city's pipes or homeowner's pipes. So there will be some policy issues for the council to uh, wrestle with as far as like whether it's going to put the entire burden on the homeowner or have a you know income eligibility program for that or whether uh, we'll split the cost. There's several, a lot of cities have these programs, so we'll bring a couple of uh, options to the council on that. And then the one thing that's also assumed in the um, sewer budget is a, um, a, a one FTE to help us monitor the, uh, the flows in the collection system and help us with you know, kind of identifying these I and I areas and going out and doing the testing and finding out who has a, a leaky ladder, all those kinds of things. And it help us also with our uh, fats, oils, increase program. This is not too appetizing. But, you know, with a lot of uh, restaurants and fast food restaurants in Sandy, a lot of the uh, stuff that gets washed down the drain is, uh, you know, uh, animal fats, and that really impacts uh, the ability of the treatment plant to uh, effectively treat the wastewater. So we're going to try and concentrate on that source. And uh, most of these restaurants do have uh, interceptors to collect this stuff, but they're not very good about cleaning them out until they overflow to their parking lot and then they call it the city and we say, well, here's the problem, you know, so we want to get a handle on that where we get people on a schedule where they pump these things out on a regular basis. Are you talking about fines or are you talking about construction paid by the city or forcing them to pay, pay it in terms of these uh, greases and oils and such like that? How, how are we we, most restaurants have these devices to collect this right. stuff, but they're not very good about consistently cleaning them. Typically, they ignore them until they overflow, and so uh, we want to get everybody on the schedule and make them you know, be responsible for that and treat it before it 
you know, once they overflow, it goes into the piping system and ends up not plant. So we need to, we need to just give them a schedule to make them uh, pump these things on a regular basis. So you're and that's what this position would do. You're talking about enforcement and with fines. Well, no, we, I think we just say you've got to do it, and okay. most people would comply. You know, if somebody's checking up on them and calling them up, sending them emails and asking for receipts and proof. I like that. That's Most people, you know, comply. But if they ignore us, yeah, that would be the next step. So you're going to try the carrot before you go to the stick? Yeah, yeah. You know, most people don't even know they have these things. You know, most of these fast food restaurants are managed by some 19-year-old kid, you know. And, you know, they don't know. You know, they're, they're busy with their own problems, not worried about a problem like that. It's, you know, it's a good, you know, um, Communication effort too. Okay. And education too. I mean, it's yeah. even, even with uh, homeowners, you know, a lot of people you know, end up stuck in the kind of thing too. You know. Bacon grease, people just wash it down there. Yeah. Yeah. All right, plugging yeah. right along. Yeah. So, anyway, that's kind of a highlight of the sewer fund. <laughs> uh, anything on a high note there. Uh, so, you know, there are a couple of assumptions in this budget that we do uh, borrow some money for the uh, first phase of the. Improvements of the treatment plant, some more things like this, and that we fund this one position. And I think we have a pretty good chance of getting this one's pretty attractive interest rate. And the debt service, oh, that's one thing, this this will, I'll kill two birds with one stone. I'll do the sewer bond reserve fund. You know, we, we set aside money in uh, every budget to, you know, we have a 40 year loan for the existing sewer plant. I mean, already, it's 20 years old, we need to replace it. So um, we've been setting aside additional. Um, payments towards the debt service in this bond reserve fund. And it looks like uh, it was a good idea when we started and we'll be able to retire the current debt, uh, the debt on the current facility in uh, probably June of 2021. And um, if not sooner. And then uh, that will that will cover the debt service for this $6 million loan. That's, uh, so there shouldn't be any change in, you know, in the uh, uh, debt service to the sewer fund uh, based on this loan, and then the, so we should be prepared for the big changes once we have to incur some significant debt for the new facility. Is that a 30 year loan or how long? It's a 40 year loan. 40 years. We did it in 20 years? Uh, we'll do it in about 22. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good job. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. Um, <coughs> but, uh, oh, and then, uh, you know, water fund. Um, uh, the water fund, one of the highlights of the water fund, we're going to do an uh, update to our water master plan. And uh, I think one of the big issues we need to determine is if we uh, want to uh, connect the city of Portland has to build a new treatment plant uh, and have it in service by 2027. So uh, we're, the, uh, we're a wholesale customer in Portland, so we either have to connect to their treatment, but we're the only wholesale customer that's upstream of where Portland intends to build this facility. And so we have to decide whether we want to uh, extend the pipe to connect to it or whether we want to build our own facility and treat, have a treatable runoff. And so that's one thing we'll look at in the uh, Water Master Plan update. You know, uh, you know, this is like a half a billion dollar facility that wants to build. So it'll really impact uh, wholesale customer rates. And so we'll have to look at, you know, not only the cost, the capital cost to connect to the thing, but a long term uh, rate increase as we'll see on our wholesale rate. Right now, you know, we, uh, the wholesale purchase we do from Portland's about 50% of our water supply in the winter and about a third of it in the summer. But as the city grows, it's going to be the only source that can expand, so there'll be a much bigger chunk of, um, of expenses for uh, wholesale water purchases. So we need to look at that as well. Any idea what the, the piping would cost us to go down to their pipe? It certainly can't be a half a billion dollars. Well, no, no, I'm talking about the Portland's facility. Yeah. Well, well, they're they're, they're going to spend dollars. half a billion in this. So we're going to have to buy it from them with that shiny new facility. Yeah, right. Our wholesale rates will go up quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to do to us what we're doing to our sewer utility. Yeah. Right. We're a cusp. We're just, we it's going to fall downhill anyway. I mean, that's what sewer does, right? Yeah. <laughs> so that's one thing about the water mass plan, as well as a few other things. <laughs> and then um, one thing we're looking at, too, is part of this uh, LED conversion for the street lights is uh, we're also having the same term look at converting um, about uh, <coughs> 3,300 uh, water meters to this newer smart meter technology. Mm -hmm. They'd be read by our, uh, our, our uh, 
the two sending antenna we have. And um, uh, if, we, if we put in new meters, they'll be more accurate than the existing meters. And then uh, if we've, hopefully we'll be able to increase the revenue enough from the increased meter accuracy that we would be able to pay the debt service for the conversion. So we have a, a uh, firm looking at uh, those costs right now. That's it. I mean, he's getting rid of that contract with him, right? I'm sorry? I mean, he's getting rid yeah, of that's, that's another oh, initial plan. That's another thing we do. Uh, you know, one thing we do in both funds is we contract out the operations at the water treatment plant, the sewer treatment plant. We don't have so many employees down there. We use a firm to do that work. And another thing we contract out for is uh, part of the interview. He's pretty old, so he's retiring. <laughs> What's that? Is he old enough to be retiring at age? Well, it's a, it's a firm, so the end they send oh. four guys out and they do it all in a day. Okay. Jordan, what are your thoughts on that? What's that? What are your thoughts on that? <laughs> <laughs> all right, anything else for Mike? All right, thanks, Mike. Okay, 929. We have Sandy Nat, that's it? I think we should do Sandy Nat. Um, push through? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Push through. Push through. All right. yeah. <laughs> Three, Three minutes, Greg. Three minutes, minutes to win it. <laughs> <laughs> You just got to start me. And now that he's sad, I move that we move it to next year. <laughs> <laughs> Greg would like to change the name of Sandy Nett to A Sandy Nett. <laughs> Which page are you? I don't know. Uh, 80. Let's go. 80. Three minutes. Let's go. Okay. Well, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Greg, and I'm the interim IT director uh, for Sandy Nett and the IT department there. So, working. So a uh, quick uh, outline of the components of our budget are uh, mainly capital expenditures, which are used to uh, build out and maintain our existing fiber optic network. Also wireless, copper, um, GFAS, which is basically a uh, short DSL. And uh, it's, in, it's increased over time because of the popularity of, uh, with Sandy, uh, with SandyNet, but it, uh, we are starting to see it show that it will slow down, so the budget will reflect that, but there it is always going to be capital expenditures, as I will explain to you uh, in a different slide there. Uh, contractual services are a big part of uh, Sandy Net. Uh, that also has the line item for internet access fees uh, rolled into it. And those are to pay for our upstream providers, uh, because we do have to purchase internet from other providers. And uh, as well as uh, hardware and software support for a lot of the different systems that we use and maintain within Sandy Net. And the final big one is uh, salaries. And uh, we currently consist of uh, six full-time employees and one part-time employee, which is our intern as part of kind of our youth recruitment uh, project that we do. And so some of the goals that we've set for the next couple of years, and there's no way we're gonna finish all of these, but we're at least gonna get started on them, is the uh, Number one is that we are planning on finishing the, the business district uh, for our fiber deployment. It's been, we've been working on it for the past two years. Uh, we were working on it when I left, and then when I came back, we were still working on it, so I want to get that wrapped up in 2019, and we're getting close, and that will uh, allow us to shut down our existing Wi-Fi network within the city and get all that old legacy equipment removed off of the tons of buildings that are still hosting it. Uh, they only have a couple customers on it. Uh, and the next one is to deploy the remaining GFAST equipment that we have. We've been sitting on this equipment for about two years and it's appreciating and we haven't actually been able to go out and install it. And so it would be nice to be able to reach out to apartment complexes and multiple dwelling units and uh, provide high-speed internet service uh, to compete with other the local competition where as of now we basically have to tell them on the phone we cannot provide service to those locations. And. Uh, I will say in the past six months or so, I've received a large number of inquiries of people wanting fiber service in the industrial areas, uh, in Sandy, down Industrial Way, and then also on Reuben Lane. And I have to tell them, uh, because the, the, the Urban Renewal District is where we got the money originally for the uh, business fiber project, and so we've never, we never received money for that, so we never planned for it. But in the next two years, I'd like to look at being able to expand out in those areas because those are a lot of enterprise contracts in areas that can bring in some uh, higher monthly revenue for uh, Sandia as well as phone if they decide to host with us. 
Uh, if you uh, are familiar with the kind of the smart home trend that's showing up, uh, a lot of big ISPs, Comcast is doing it. I think Wave even has a small smart home system with their service, and uh, it allows you to basically uh, control appliances or make your, your home, as they, as they say, smart, part of the whole Internet of Things, and it's kind of the next step of pushing the ISP into the customer's home and providing additional services on top of your internet for them. Uh, our current router provider that we uh, build our fiber gear has been incorporating smart home technology into their new line of routers and that will be uh, rolling out to production probably in the next year or two so it would be good to start looking at getting some sort of system in place that will allow us to uh, stay competitive and also take a trend where we can uh, help out with these services and also collect monthly revenue uh, for those those services as well. And uh, yeah, I won't go into detail on that right so now. The current routers don't deal with some of these. Uh, so we're talking things like Amazon, like Alexa. Sure, I've got, well, I've got Nest and I've got Alexa. Yeah, and this would incorporate the technology that those use into your router. So like these these actual routers have Alexa built into them, or you can turn on the Google Assistant, or instead of buying the appliance to manage your smart home for like your Nest. I'm actually not familiar with the Nest, if it has a separate appliance or not, but certain things like Zigbee and Z-Wave technology has the antenna built in, so you don't have to have a separate appliance to run it. It's all inside your router. Okay. Uh, next really big one is uh, that we'd be, we're we exploring kind of a co-op partnership, I don't know what the name of it is, between SaniNet and uh, CBX, or Clackamas County's Broadband Exchange. Uh, they've shown interest that they want to be able to provide broadband to underserved areas within Clackamas County, and uh, it's certainly a big opportunity to look at, but uh, it requires a lot of extensive review and discussion within the next biennium to research and make sure that uh, Sandy Net has its, its goals of this community in mind and that those would not slip if we pursued, it, uh, pursued the option. And uh, finally, uh, we do want to help uh, eliminate the digital divide within Sandy. It's kind of a buzzword, you kind of heard about the digital divide, and you can see it in Sandy is a great example where you can go right outside of city limits and have dial-up. You know, you can see Sandy, city limits, but you can't get good internet there. And it, 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 the digital divide is not just limited to poor internet, it's also look at your education, look at how your community responds when it has access to uh, resources that allow you to use the internet on it as we become more and more dependent on it. So. Uh, we like to work with uh, the community and other surrounding areas or um, local businesses such as like the ant farm that and just see if there are ways that we can help eliminate the digital divide there. Quick question for you. Sure. And maybe just a suggestion if it's not being done. I'm just wondering if you've done master planning for like the next five to ten years with Sandy Net. The existing one is sitting on my desk waiting to be updated. Okay. Yes, that is. Because I'm just, I'm looking at a lot of these items. I think a master plan would be extremely helpful. It is. In and mapping out when and what's being done. Right. And our current master plan has been completed, essentially, which means that you know, we need kind of a direction. And so I, these are things I've come up with. And Joe, um, who not to pass the buck on to, but uh, kind of went through and, and set a lot of these numbers here and kind of showed me what they, the reasoning behind it here. So. I can try to explain line items to you guys here, but I will I will do my best, but I can't guarantee you I'm gonna have to come up and look into it a little bit deeper and get an answer back to you. But uh, he mentioned also that he wanted to update the master plan. It didn't get done before he left, but he wanted to because uh, I think it's very important as a kind of a goal setting uh, for driving the Sandy Net in the future. And that was the goal for the Sandy Net board for the future, is to update that master plan that Joe and I Which we have about. talks about that, and okay. we're gonna be working also that could have been a goal too. So kind of a brief summary. It is small, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's bigger than it's bigger than others. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you guys can look at it in your packets too. Uh, just a couple of notable changes. I'll try to fly through these. Uh, revenue is expected to increase uh, dramatically if you guys haven't noticed that. And the budget summary includes an increase uh, in standing net fees for the uh, 300 meg residential price. Uh, around July-ish, and uh, this, so that'll be talks, and that is uh, that was scheduled back when the original fiber project uh, was put in that after five years we would do a $2 rate increase, and that's what our budget reflects for in terms of revenue right now. And across the board? Uh, across the, the $2 increase is 
uh, I have to look at it more detail. I think it only affects a few services, so like it doesn't actually affect the gigabit, if I recall correctly, mm -hmm. which okay. we might go through and adjust. I'm not sure if we need to. I don't know in terms of how much it would devalue the gigabit service around these people would switch for a $2 increase or potentially bring them close together. More people might hop over to gigabit. That the original plan was for the, uh, the, the base service. Yeah. And uh, our capital outlay is expected to decrease mostly because Sandian is already built out. I did highlight a couple of projects. Uh, we have gone way over our capital expenditures budget in the past because uh, of its popularity, but uh, we are reaching a point where we will have built out so much of Sandy that it is even possible to keep, well, I don't want to say that. It would be, uh, <laughs> it, we're, we're reaching a point where it's like, it's, it's unheard of for ISPs to make, make give more tape rates than we currently have. And so it's not saying it's not possible, it's just when things in a balanced environment it doesn't usually happen amongst three providers. Within the urban growth boundary. Uh, within city, within city, 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 city. city. What, What's your number now? We are a little over 70% of homes available. And so that doesn't include um, new subdivisions coming in right now. But that's not accurate. Yeah, Joe and I have a debate on that, but let's get through this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree with you. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> we'll, we can talk that offline. I, I calculate my numbers based on GIS. <laughs> yeah, it, so. we're on the same path. Yeah. Now, so. Greg agrees with <laughs> Sorry, that's a different. This guy's 110% fake is what I said. Yeah. <laughs> so, a couple of uh, revenue highlights is that fiber charges, uh, residential and business, um, that's where we make most of our money. Is I will show you our, our uh, interesting graph in the next slide here. Our wireless charges, uh, rule expected, is expected to go up in the next couple of years. In city Wi Fi should hopefully be zero because we will finish up the uh, business district and they'll be all on fiber. We do make money off of voice over IP services, both residential and business, um, but uh, residential mostly uh, business usually requires it depends because they have their own systems for a lot of things there. And so by the end of 2020, in-city Wi-Fi will be off and uh, it'll just uh, we'll have a lot, le lot less wireless to manage. Um, in terms of enterprise uh, customers, uh, I hope to keep growing these, especially as I push over more into those industrial areas. You know, we've gotten a couple of big contracts in just the past six months, which has been awesome. And uh, where we really make money on those is uh, it is through the support where they have that tier one support, where they have that my phone number, where they can call me any time of the night, and I will fix their problem. And uh, also, I know, and uh, uh, we do offer some contractual services, mostly from historical thing, uh, areas, kind of like uh, Clackamas County Bank. We do uh, push things like free Wi-Fi into their, into their, uh, their buildings, and uh, we are compensated for things like that. So we do make uh, some off money and miscellaneous revenue. <coughs> well, it's not miscellaneous, but it's in terms of all of our other revenue highlights, it's kind of out there, but it is in terms of revenue. It, there is a fair amount in some areas. Craig, since you mentioned that the seventy thousand for the seventeen nine time miscellaneous revenue is that just been shifted into other line items on the for revenues? You need to run that by me one more time. So uh, under page eighty two, uh, under miscellaneous revenue, there. Yeah, miss, yeah, seventy thousand last year, Zippo this year. Yeah, so that's usually if I'm that's not calculated. It said that's ongoing, isn't it, or is that what it, if we are? budgeted for wanting to achieve. I don't think that in the original budget for 1719 there was any miscellaneous revenue budgeted. That was money that had come in before we did the last supplemental budget and because we were just trying to clean up some things. Sure. It was known revenue so it was Good. increased and, and budgeted for, accounted for it at that point. Um, not accounting for any, at this point for the next biennium, um, if something comes in, then that would be fantastic. But yeah. um, and usually that would be like big installations yeah. off of enterprise customers where you know we're building out to them and they're willing to pay a large price tag for that service. And there are some of those coming down the line here shortly. So this one, hopefully you can kind of see it there. The big yellow mark is residential fiber. Uh, so uh, as of the end of this poll, actually as of today, we, uh, we peak at $140,000 in revenue a month uh, now, and the majority of that is uh, residential fiber, or actually, yes, residential fiber, 
business fiber is growing, and if you saw it on a smaller scale, you would see business wireless going, or uh, res inside, inside city Wi-Fi going down and residential fiber going up. Uh, you know, there's that, uh, there's the, the one that jumps up to the very top is no association, that's install fees for homes that reset every month, and so uh, it's always gonna look like that. Uh, we do make a lot of money off our active ethernet fiber, which is a lot of our old historical fiber customers, ones up the mountain, ones in town. Uh, they're not quite on our g -Pond fiber project that we did in 2014, but they are, uh, they're pretty much all enterprise accounts that bring in more than your standard rates. And I'll throw this kind of picture out, uh, if you guys can see it. All that purple is underground uh, fiber infrastructure that we have within Sandy. We have uh, close to 60 miles of underground fiber at this point, I believe. And, uh, and it, you know, it's constantly growing. That's not necessarily super up to date. That's just a picture I found to kind of show you that we do have a lot of presence in here and that we do have the ability to pass every house in Sandy. And so uh, there's, always, there's always more to be done. And, and it's, uh, it's pretty cool, actually, when you kind of look at it that way. So, are there any questions about the Sandina budget? Cool. Finally, I'll, I'll look through the IT budget. Uh, it's a lot easier. Uh, IT budget is also composed of capital capital expenditures, uh, mostly for server infrastructure, um, desktop uh, refreshes, uh, which hasn't really occurred lately. It's more on a one-off uh, scenario. Uh, contractual services, which is uh, which also includes. Uh, like cloud web hosting and services, which I can go into more detail, I'll go into more detail on. And also there is a lot of those support contracts that we have uh, for providers, so if something fails, we can get something rushed to us. And also licensings for things like Adobe, Microsoft Office, antivirus, all of those things are part of contractual services. And we also have one full-time employee, which is dedicated to uh, inside city systems administration, Jeff. And uh, we learned that having one, just one full-time employee is enough so far for the inside city. There's plenty to do, but we're not having to share him with SandyNet, so he's at the city's disposal for any any other needs now. So it's always it's been paying off. And then if you actually look at the numbers, it's technically a little over one. A little bit of my budget comes out of the IT budget as well. So some of the goals that we have set for the IT department here are uh, that we do want to uh, continue to implement cloud services. We've done this within the last biennium. Uh, we've chosen AWS as our flavor uh, for offloading a lot of our, our systems to the cloud and provides kind of redundancy and can uh, reduce your costs if done correctly. And so we, uh, it's not a matter of us just throwing stuff that we have on site into the cloud. We have to redesign it around the cloud so that we are optimizing those savings. And uh, so that's something we'll continue to do. I think we're always going to have on site stuff due to the nature of government software and how it's written is that it will, we can't just stick it all in the cloud uh, as much as I would love to. So, but we can certainly work on it to reduce our capital expenditures for server refreshes in the future. Um, we also want to explore the uh, idea of moving away from our current uh, hardline phone trunk that the city uses for all their phones onto a more internet-based one for lower costs and increased stability. Uh, I haven't been super satisfied with our current phone provider, and it would be uh, it would be a lot of savings if we could move them to uh, a SIP uh, trunk instead of our current PRI. And uh, the, the planning, or it's the building department is going to be retiring their old homegrown uh, permitting software in favor of, I think it's the, the state provides it. And so that is one of our goals here is to get that deployed. It's supposed to roll out this year at some point. Um, and so uh, we'll be excited to finally get off that old legacy system and on something hopefully a little more uh, up to date. And uh, the last one, this one's kind of been a, a long time dream of mine since I started here, has been to um, increase the interconnections of our department software and processes uh, using leveraging it with IT. Uh, the idea is to hopefully reduce busy work. There's a lot of manual work that's done here that I think was wasting a lot of people's time that could be automated through simple integration techniques that I think our, our staff has the ability to incorporate. I would like to, you know, if we had time to sit down with departments and uh, ultimately get down and, and get to some of these, get some of these big things out of the way, I think it would benefit everybody. And 
And so that <laughs> one's small. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't disappoint. <laughs> you win the award. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, we are expected to do uh, some sort of server or hardware refresh, and that's why we still have capital uh, expenses in the in the. Uh, this biennium here, although it is lower than it has been in the past, and we did see an increase in contractual services for uh, those cloud services, and uh, we are expected to complete a debt service payoff, which, I, if I recall correctly, is for the phone system that we purchased, and so uh, that would that would be nice to finally get off. And the IT budget has been pretty healthy as opposed to the same day one. <laughs> so, if you have any questions. Um, Otherwise, I think I'm done. Great job. Okay. So we made it through. Um, I wanted to thank all the city staff that stuck around pretty late tonight, I know. Um, I do this a couple times a month over at the college. It's always a long night, and we really appreciate you being here and all the time that you spent dedicating to the budgets. Um, I like to look at this budget and say, it's not really trimming fat, but we're cutting into muscle a little bit. Um, I think you probably all felt that over the past couple of weeks as well, too, and just appreciate the response from the city after our meeting with police as well, too, in, in designing and building this budget. So, all right, anything in closing? Anybody no, uh, it doesn't look like there's anyone here for public comment. Um, okay. I'd so. like to open the floor for public comment. <laughs> at 9.49. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe uh, more on that first on the agenda for the next meeting, um, budget committee, change, any, any changes to the proposed budget that the budget committee would have, uh, deliberations, and then approval um, approval of the tax rate. Wait, when are you also, looking for that? Next week. Monday. Yeah. And then um, the urban renewal budget as well. Uh, We're going to do that tonight. You ready? We're just getting started. Yeah. Was, there, was there a couple more, the non-departmental and yeah, so we can, we'll finish up on Monday? Yeah, we can cover those. There's the administrative departments right. that, you know, we can really go over pretty fast. Right, yeah, I, I just want to make sure we don't forget that because that is part of the process. Yeah. All right, so with that, we'll adjourn our meeting at 9.50. I can't give you time for Yeah, that would be